The uh, Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change will now come to order. I recognize myself for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Today, the Subcommittee will examine H.R. 5544, the American Innovation and Manufacturing Leadership Act of 2020, which was introduced last week by Representatives Olson, Peters, Stefanik, and myself. Hydrofluorocarbons, commonly known as HFCs, are a class of chemicals primarily used as refrigerants in heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration. HFCs gained widespread use in the 1990s as replacements for ozone-depleting substances such as CFCs and HCFCs, but HFCs have their own challenges, which is why a global transition to the next generation of refrigerant technologies is currently underway. United States manufacturers are already investing billions of dollars in the research and development of new products and equipment to maintain their competitiveness. In fact, American com uh, companies are global leaders in the development of HFC substitutes. One such class of substitutes are known as HFOs. HFOs are more environmentally friendly, but even more importantly, American manufacturers stand to gain the most in the global marketplace by leaning into this uh, transition. According to a study by the Inter-Industry uh, Forecasting at the University of Maryland, the HFC phase-down will drive the creation of some 33,000 new United States manufacturing jobs, tw uh, 12.5 billion more in direct manufacturing, uh, 12.5 billion dollars more in direct manufacturing output annually, a significant trade balance improvement in equipment and chemicals, and a 25 percent growth of the U.S. share of the global export market. These projected benefits are not small. Just as important, American businesses recognize that any lagging on our part will open the door for China and other nations to erode our existing global market share. This bill supports the industry in anticipating such competition and would help propel America's industry. I would like to explain briefly a few aspects of this bipartisan proposal. First, we are not proposing a ban. This bill would phase down the production and consumption of HFCs over 15 years, limiting the production and consumption to 15 percent of baseline levels beginning in 2036. The benefits include certainty for manufacturers and consumers and an orderly and predictable transition to next generation technologies while still allowing for exceptions for essential uses for which no substitute is available. The legislation is modeled on Title VI of the Clean Air Act which was enacted in 1990 with 401 bipartisan votes in the House and proved an able vehicle to foster an orderly market-based phase-down of HFC's um, predecessors. In fact, that earlier transition away from ozone-depleting substances was successful at an even lower cost than originally anticipated. Second, this bill will not force consumers to replace equipment before the end of its useful life. Today, some older equipment is still using CFCs. This framework will guarantee that consumers are protected during the transition. These benefits are why a phase-down of this kind has received incredibly broad support. I have served on this subcommittee for seven years. I cannot remember a time when we had the United States Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, and the National Resources Defense Council in complete agreement on anything, let alone granting new, targeted authority to EPA. Companion legislation has received significant bipartisan support in the Senate with 32 co-sponsors, half Republican and half Democratic. On Capitol Hill, the phrase common sense legislation gets thrown around a lot, but this bill truly fits that description. It addresses an environmental concern in a manner that will spur innovation and make U.S. manufacturers more globally competitive. This bill presents us a bipartisan opportunity to ensure the next generation of refrigerants are American-made and that our constituents experience the significant economic and job benefits that come from American-led innovation. I want to thank Mr. Olson for co-leading this effort, uh, and I yield the remainder of my time uh, to him. Thank you, Chairman Tonko, the Rep Republican Member Shimkus, and members of the subcommittee let me wave on this morning. Uh, this hearing is about H.R. 5544, the so-called AIM Act. This is a rare bipartisan bill that, as was mentioned, is supported by normal combatants like the ATR, Club Freedom Works, the NRDC. They appreciate the hard work done by Chairman Tonko, 7,000 people back home working for DICON, living in Katy, Texas, in Texas 22, 
appreciate your hard work too, sir. If people in America, manufacturers, appreciate all this hard work to get this bill where it is today. I'm proud of H.R. 5544. The AIM Act is a common sense approach that will create American jobs, expand exports, and encourage more investment in our economy. New jobs, about 33,000 are expected. We'll keep jobs here in America that may go overseas. This bill provides a clear, deliberate framework to transition from HCFCs, puts American manufacturers, American workers, and American consumers first. It ensures we keep the doors open to foreign markets that have been open because of our new competitive Mr. tax Chairman, code. Mr. Chairman, my colleagues, 33 seconds over. I thank the Chairman. I thank the Ranking Member. I'm proud to support this bill. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Shimkus, ranking member of the Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change, for five minutes for his opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me. Today's legislative hearing demands a certain baseline amount of knowledge about the subject, particularly to review a bill on this multi-layered subject and whose text itself belies the many issues it is trying to address. If I didn't know better, I would think, as we are going to hear today, that this is a simple subject that certain parts of the industry have worked with a few environmental advocacy orga organizations to solve. I want to believe that tidy story, but the more I look into this issue, the more my eyes notice a story much different from the one my ears are hearing. The issues we're discussing in this bill before us today go back five decades. In fact, the last time this committee addressed ozone depleting substances and the Montreal Protocol, only one third of the members of both this committee and the full committee were on the panel. This issue is far too big and has far too many implications on the American consumer for our committee to put members in a position of asking questions about legislation for which they have little background. Moreover, Mr. Chairman, after the minority outlined the need for a comprehensive and fair look at both the issue and the bill, since the committee had not done anything to put them in context for us, the majority denied the minority a second witness for this hearing. This was not because that perspective was already covered. This was not because there were time pressures or the panel was already unwieldy. No, this rejected request was done to suppress dissenting voices. It is unseemly and sours the desire that some have to get to, quote unquote, yes on this bill. Speaking of the bill, I do have some questions about it that I want to explore based upon what I do know about this subject. This bill seeks to phase out production of HFCs or hydrofluorocarbons. I question how much a bill like this is needed. Why? The Illinois-based North American Association of Food Equipment Manufacturers is the lead trade association for commercial food service refrigeration projects. It not only has taken a position on, it hasn't taken a position on this legislation, but since 2015 has proactively, on their own, undertaken transitioning away from HFCs to meet customers' demands. How many other parts of the impacted universe are also making this transition without a government mandate? If it is necessary, I understand the bill's industry advocates want a law because states like California are acting in a way that is creating an uneven national marketplace. Yet this legislation contains no preemption provisions. Perhaps the states didn't engage much after Montreal almost four decades ago, but as Tosca and CAFE debates have recently shown, increasing federal action is no barrier to additional state action and sometimes serves as an incentive for more state action. The accelerated phase out and technology transition provisions in this legislation also give me pause. I worry that as Justice Kavanaugh found with certain significant new alternatives programs, commonly known as SNAP rules, these provisions can be gained by market actors for competitive advantage at the expense of consumers. Likewise, these provisions could be used by non-market actors to drive technology that is infeasible and without EPA needing much of a basis to make that leap. Finally, I think it bears mentioning that we should be exploring the constitutional precedent of this proposal, an effort to implement requirements necessary for participation in the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. This amendment has not been submitted to the Senate for ratification by either the Obama or the Trump administrations. While I understand the attractiveness of a proposal like this to, to some, I wonder whether a federal court would see this as a durable solution. Mr. Chairman, although I wish we had legitimate small business and other sector perspe perspective represented, 
I want to welcome our witnesses here this morning. I especially welcome Energy and Commerce Committee staff alumnus Ben Lieberman to our second panel. Ben served our committee with honor for nearly 10 years on these issues, and it's good to have his friendly face back in the committee room. And Mr. Chairman, I'm what, uh, going off script for a second. Uh, I, I had constantly defended uh, the majority over the past year uh, through our, our rush to legislate bypassing regular order, which would define it as having a hearing on the general subject and then doing a subcommittee legislative hearing and then going through markup. Uh, we're, in a new, we're in a new year. Um, it's hard to continue to defend that position of not going through regular order when we haven't had a hearing on the Montreal Protocol, HFCs, or CFCs in over, over a decade, which, which makes it more difficult for my colleagues, as I said in the opening statement, one third of us have never had this before us. So with that, I wish we would return to regular order and I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Pallone, chair of the full committee, for five minutes for his opening statement, please. Thank you, Chairman Tonko. We're here this morning to discuss H.R. 5544, the Bipartisan American Innovation and Manufacturing Leadership Act. This legislation is supported by both industry and the environmental community. It will benefit our economy, maintain American manufacturing leadership, create jobs, and protect the environment. I want to congratulate Chairman Tonko and Representative Olson, Peter, and Stefanik for seizing this opportunity. The bill will help the United States maintain its position as a leader in the chemical, appliance, and equipment industries. It will also allow us to continue as a leader in innovation and on global environmental issues. H.R. 5544 builds upon our previous experience in phasing out CFCs and the replacement chemicals, HCFCs. Our success working with other nations within the global framework of the Montreal Pro Protocol is healing the ozone layer and reducing risk associated with higher exposures to ultraviolet radiation. Because CFCs and HCFCs are also potent greenhouse gases, their phase-out also averted additional global warming, and their replacement chemicals, hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs, helped us to address the ozone problem but, but are also potent greenhouse gases. Fortunately, American companies are innovating new substitutes for HFCs, and that means we have an opportunity to gain additional environmental benefits. Innovation by industry resulted in a transition away from CFCs that was less costly to business and consumers than originally anticipated, and I'm confident we can achieve the same outcome in the transition away, away from HFCs. The European Union uh, and other nations like Japan, Canada, and China are already transitioning away from HFCs. This legislation will provide the certainty and stability American companies need to do the same. Not only will it help these companies remain competitive in the global market for air conditioning, heating, and other consumer products, but it will also help them increase their share of the global market. And it has the potential of creating tens of thousands of high-quality American jobs. The bill, H.R. 5544, embraces innovation and the power of the market to add billions to our economy while delivering environmental benefits, phasing down the use of HFCs and transitioning to next-generation technologies provides the policy certainty American companies need to capitalize on their investments in innovation and provide consumers with quality products that are anticipated to have lower operating costs. So I think this bill is good for workers, good for the economy, good for consumers, and good for the environment. And I thank our witnesses for being here today. And we'll welcome back to the committee Ben Lieberman, who once served on the Republican staff. And I'd like to re uh, yield the remaining time to uh, Representative Peters. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Today's a good day. We're here to discuss the American Innovation and Manufacturing Leadership Act of 2020, a bipartisan bill that enjoys widespread support from industry groups and environmental organizations, Democrats and Republicans, and both chambers of commerce, uh, Congress. It's also a bill that I'm proud to support as an original co-sponsor. As we will hear today, the global phase down of HFCs has begun and their transition provides an opportunity for the United States to establish new domestic production facilities and innovative industrial processes to meet the growing demand for HFC alternatives from countries around the world. There's plenty of evidence that the private sector is poised to lead this transition if they have the right legal framework. First, major manufacturers in the U.S., but also Japan, China, and India are developing low-cost alternatives to HFC. 
In California, there are more than 5,500 direct jobs in the HVACR industry alone, and the bill's orderly phase-down of HFCs is projected to create tens of thousands more jobs nationally. Second, phasing down the use of HFCs is certainly profitable. The Chamber of Commerce and the Consumer Goods Forum, which represents over 400 member com uh, companies, enthusiastically support the bill. Third, companies that use HFCs in their operations and supply chains will benefit from the clarity and certainty this bill provides. Fourth, this bill will protect American businesses against highly anti-competitive practices that include the dumping of highly subsid subsidized HFCs. Right now, there are no limits on how much HFCs can be imported, and this bill would change that. And finally, placing HFCs with non-HFC alternatives has no downside. It protects the environment while also promoting industry. So I'm eager to get this hearing underway. I thank my colleagues and committee staff for assembling uh, this important hearing. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor, uh, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Um, we now, I now recognize Mr. Walden, Ranking Member of the Full Committee, uh, for five minutes for his opening statement, please. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, today's hearing obviously examines a bill that would mandate a rapid phase down the U.S. of the use of hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs. Now, these substances, we all know, contribute to climate change when emitted into the atmosphere, serve many important uses, including as a very critical ingredient in cooling and refrigeration equipment throughout our society. Scrutiny of this issue for the purpose of addressing risks to the climate is important, and it's welcome. However, the approach today falls short of what's necessary to make good policy uh, decisions. Indeed, there appears to be a rush towards a prepackaged legislative solution without having developed a full understanding of the problem we're trying to solve or whether this regulatory approach is truly the most appropriate way to work in a dynamic and very complex marketplace or in the best interest of the American consumer or even who specifically benefits from this. To do this completely requires more upfront work in terms of oversight and background hearings, as we heard from Mr. Shimkus, um, so we can have a record that we can rely upon as we consider pretty major policy options that have long-term implications for environmental policy, for market competition, and household economics. This is especially the case in policy areas like this one, where most members have, frankly, pretty limited experience. Not all, however. Consider that the broad backdrop of this legislation are concerns about international emissions and the international agreement under the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer. That was finalized in the late 1980s. Yet the committee, which was instrumental in developing provisions to address implementation of the protocol in the Clean Air Act, has not had a single hearing on that topic for more than a decade. Meanwhile, we're considering a bill that implicates U.S. participation under the protocol and I'd like to better understand how this will work in real life and practice. Recent amendments under the protocol, which have not been ratified by the United States Senate, anticipate a rapid growth of demand for refrigerants and cooling that's occurring in the developing world. How to address the needs of the developing world is a key policy matter. For example, we should understand how mandating U.S. conversion to new technologies addresses development internationally and whether it is this bill or uh, an amendment ratification that is the linchpin in the Kigali amendment ratification. It's worth noting that certain industries were already innovating towards non-HFC substances, which begs the question, does this have to be mandated phase down? What are the problems in the marketplace that require government intervention at this time, rather than the natural turnover to newer, more innovative technologies? We'd also benefit from a deeper understanding of the implications of any policies to phase out HFCs on existing U.S. stock of refrigeration and cooling equipment in businesses and in households and automobiles and what those costs might be. Are there safety issues to consider with replacement substances? We haven't heard about that. Are there energy efficiency issues? We should learn more. Will, will routine repair and maintenance costs accelerate for consumers? Will states implement their own more accelerated schedules for phasing out HFCs that will send the market into further turmoil? I'm hopeful the witnesses can help us answer some of these questions today and help us understand other areas that may be worth exploring. There appears to be strong support from industry, environmentalists, and others to work on this legislation. And to be clear, I'm open to working on it but we should look to do more regarding HFCs and related greenhouse gases, and we should be open to practical policies, and I am. Maybe this legislation is a good starting point, but I think we have to look carefully to be sure it will provide the benefits promised and actually work in the best interests of American consumers. So I should note we have some quality witnesses here this morning. 
including Ben Lieberman. We're delighted to have you back. Served on our committee staff for many years, did great public service, um, and did much to ensure we were keeping the consumer in mind. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, willfully yield back the remaining minute of my time so we can get about the hearing, and thank you. Thank you, Representative Walden. And uh, the gentleman yields back. The uh, Chair would like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' written opening statements shall be made part of the record. Um, I now will introduce the uh, witness for our first panel, single witness, uh, at today's hearing, Ms. Cynthia Newbert, Director of Stratospheric Protection Division, Office of Atmospheric Programs at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Office of Air and Radiation. Uh, before we begin, I would like to explain the lighting system. In front of you um, are a series of lights. The light will initially be green. The light will turn yellow when you have one minute remaining. Please begin to wrap up your testimony at that point. The light will turn red when your time has expired. So at this time, the chair recognizes Ms. Newberg for five minutes, please, to provide um, your opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Tonko, Ranking Member Shimkus, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Cindy Newberg, and I'm the Director of the Stratospheric Protection Division in the Office of Atmospheric Programs in the Office of Air and Radiation at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. The Stratospheric Protection Division implements the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer in Title VI of the Clean Air Act, which have the shared goal of restoring the ozone layer. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today regarding H.R. 5544. Although the agency does not have a formal position on the bill, my testimony today will focus on how EPA implements current stratospheric protection programs, as well as technical aspects of the committee's bill to address hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs, which are substitutes for certain ozone-depleting substances. To provide a brief background, I have been with EPA for more than 27 years and have served on delegations for the Montreal Protocol representing the United States and EPA's interests under the last three administrations. The Montreal Protocol is a global agreement to protect the Earth's ozone layer by phasing out production and consumption of chemicals that deplete it. The protocol was signed by the United States in 1987 and ratified by the Senate in 1988. Today, all countries that are members of the UN are parties to the protocol. By, by restoring the ozone layer, we reduce risk of skin cancer and cataracts. For Americans, full implementation of the Montreal Protocol is expected to result in the avoidance of more than 280 million cases of skin cancer and more than 45 million cases of cataracts in the United States alone. Ozone depleting substances have been used in many households, industrial, and military applications. The phase out of the U.S. production and consumption of ozone-depleting substances is managed by issuing tradable allowances through rulemakings. In addition, Title VI of the Clean Air Act includes complementary measures to smooth transition to alternatives, including provisions to support recovery and reuse of existing, a chemi existing chemicals and identification of alternatives for relevant applications. To facilitate transition, EPA has implemented domestic regulations and partnership programs that have enabled the United States to not only meet, but to exceed our commitments outlined in the Montreal Protocol. Many other countries have looked at our programs as models. And at the same time, U.S. companies have shown great leadership with the development and deployment of alternatives. In the wake of the Montreal Protocol and Title VI of the Clean Air Act, the U.S. has been substituting ozone-depleting substances with alternatives, including to a large extent HFCs. And at the same time, global demand for refrigeration and air conditioning has increased, and more HFCs are being used, particularly in cooling applications. While HFCs do not deplete the ozone layer, most HFCs are put in greenhouse gases. The AIM Act would establish new domestic authority to phase down production and consumption of HFCs. If signed, the AIM Act would require the EPA to do many of the same types of activities for HFCs that we have done and continue to do for the ozone-depleting substances. The bill would require EPA to publish a list of HFCs and their exchange values, 
which are defined in the bill. It would require periodic reporting to the EPA for HFCs that are produced, imported, exported, reclaimed, destroyed, and used and consumed in the manufacture of other chemicals. It would establish a baseline which would be used to help create an allowance and trading program. The EPA administrator would bear responsibility for allocating allowances on either an annual or multi-year basis following a phase down schedule for production and consumption. Transfer of allowances between companies would be allowed and the administrator could be petitioned to increase the speed of the phase down schedule. The administrator would also be required to promulgate regulations to establish standards for the management of HFCs to control practices for servicing, repairing, disposing, or installing of equipment. Furthermore, the administrator would be authorized to facilitate transition to next generation technologies by establishing restrictions on specific uses of HFCs based on availability of alternatives. Again, while EPA does not have a position on the legislation, I am here on behalf of the agency to discuss technical aspects of the bill and provide a perspective on our stratospheric protection programs. In conclusion, the AIM Act would provide EPA authority to phase down production and consumption of HFCs in the United States, as well as authority to establish complementary measures. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, and uh, we're indeed fortunate to have you here today um, because of your wealth of technical expertise on many issues before us. But uh, in regard to this committee hearing, subcommittee hearing, thank you for being here for the technical assistance that EPA is providing to the committee and subcommittee on this legislation. So, Ms. Newberg, I would like to begin broadly. First, subject to the technical assistance EPA has provided, does EPA have any concerns about its ability to implement uh, this legislation? Thank you very much, Chairman Tonko. I believe our view is that based on um, the technical assistance that we provided, if that were taken up in the bill, we believe that it could be implemented. Thank you. And how does the regulatory program that this legislation creates uh, compare to existing programs under Title VI of the Clean Air Act? There are many similarities between what's in this bill and what is in the current uh, Title VI of the Clean Air Act and how we um, implement that in uh, the domestic programs. There are a few differences between the two, uh, but there are relatively um, provisions that are more niche, and most of the main uh, components, particularly the phase down, is very similar. Thank you. And do you foresee EPA implementing a program that phases down HFCs in a substantially similar manner as to how CFCs and HCFCs were addressed? I can speak to what's in this bill, and if we were to implement something that was based on this bill, then there is certainly a likelihood that we would do so in a similar manner. Thank you. And for entities already subject to regulation under Title VI, does EPA believe it could implement this legislation in an efficient and streamlined manner that minimizes additional burdens on regulated entities? I believe that we would look at our existing regulations and seek to find ways to make sure that they were taken up together. There's a few places in this bill where specifically coordination with existing programs is mentioned. And there's at least, uh, I can recall, at least one other instance in our technical assistance where we suggest similar coordination should be requested. Thank you. And Ms. Newberg, if I could please direct your attention to Section 3, Paragraph D of the draft bill. Uh, my understanding, do you have the section? Yep. Yeah. My understanding of the intent of this provision is to preclude the agency from listing a blend of substances as a regulated substance. That way, if the blend contains a regulated HFC and some other chemical, the non-HFC chemical would not become subject to the phase down. I do not believe the intent was to affect the regulation of any listed HFC that may be used in such a blend. Does EPA believe this legislative text accomplishes this intent? So in the technical direction that we provided, EPA actually did speak to this particular provision. And we indicated that we thought that um, based on our understanding and based on what you have just said now, it looked to us like um, the provision may have been drafted perhaps more broadly than what was intended. It looked like the intent may be to affect uh, insurance that we would not somehow be listing twice chemicals under the phase down schedule. And our suggestion was to perhaps narrow that provision. And we provided some text. Okay. And um, 
The draft legislation requires EPA to include isomers in the initial list of regulated substances. I understand the agency has suggested there may not be any benefit to this requirement. Uh, Ms. Newberg, would you please explain why the agency does not think it is necessary to include isomers in the list of regulated substances? Uh, I'd be happy to. The, the schedule and the list of chemicals that were provided on the HFCs would be the only chemicals in our, in our understanding that would be subject to the provisions. So our view was that uh, collecting information on isomers could be burdensome and would not be necessary to effectuate what was being asked for in the, in the legislation. Thank you. Um, those are the questions I have. I will now um, re uh, allow for Chair, or excuse me, for Mr. Shemkis, our sub subcommittee ranking member, for to have five minutes for questioning, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thanks for uh, identifying Section 3D because I want to go originally to there also. Uh, uh, and based upon the questions that the Chairman already asked, I guess my follow-up question would be, what would be the practical impact of having this provision remain so ambiguous? If, if not changed based upon your advice, identifying it as ambiguous, what's the risk? Um, I appreciate the question, and I, I believe it's also one that I would want our general counsel to consult with, so we may have to come back to you on that. I think our, our view is that we may have to take up um, some better understanding of this. Um, so you you do ag agree, as you re uh, replied to the chairman, that it is am ambiguous and needs more legislative uh, scrutiny. I believe the terms I used were a little bit different. I think what I said was in our technical advice, we had suggested that if it were intended to be limited to just the phase down schedule, that it needed to be more narrowly aimed. I don't, I don't believe I had indicated it was More ambiguous. narrowly aimed, okay, more specific, more narrowly focused. If that is the intent. Okay. Yeah, and that's why we have legislative hearings. So um, uh, let me go to then, I want to ask about transparency and the public's ability to know what is happening at the agency on this matter. Is it your opinion that Section 7C3 provides transparency on decisions regarding the evaluation of petitions? Thank you very much. And uh, again, I will refer to the fact that we did provide some technical assistance on, on this section as well. And in particular, what we had um, commented on was that the provision seems to indicate that um, petitions that were denied uh, would be subject to providing uh, that information in the Federal Register. And I think our suggestion was that both petitions that were granted or denied should be treated in the same manner. So on by filing in the Federal Register, then you are uh, saying that that's the transparency of the, the, the basis of my question? I, I believe uh, that the technical advice suggests that on the grounds that we did believe a transparent process would be necessary. So, so let, let's go to um, Section 7C5. Um, does this section ensure petitions are available to the public? As drafted, it would ask that we publish the full petition, so that would make them available to the public. We did provide some advice on perhaps we could notify that they were available and make them available in a docket rather than publish the full petition in the Federal Register. Should the criteria established in Section 7D apply to regulations promulgated under both Section 7A and in response to a petition under Section 7C? So again, referring back to our technical assistance, that was the suggestion that we did make. Okay, let me just ask you some uh, general questions. This is coming from the, uh, the Democratic memo. Uh, on page one, they say a global transition away from hydrofluorocarbons is beginning. Is, do you agree with that general statement? I think generally we are seeing that. Okay, and that's without any movement of any legislation. That's just a global movement away from HFCs. Um, and on their second page, uh, they have a statement, since then the United States has led the world in the transition away from ozone depleting substances. Would you agree with that statement? I would. Um, on their third page, um, they identify that uh, EPA's refrigerant management regulations establish requirements for the handling, recovering, and disposal of refrigerants as well as the prevention and repair of leaks. This framework has led to more than 160, 168 million pounds of refrigerants being reclaimed 
from 2000 to 2016, which has avoided significant ozone depleted substances emissions to the atmosphere. Um, and then in addition, EPA regulations have successfully facilitated transitions away from ozone depleted systems in specific applications. Would you agree with that? I would need to go back and, and uh, work with my congressional affairs to provide you that answer. We do, um, we do have information reported to the agency on reclaimed refrigerant on an annual basis. So we could provide that. Yeah, and I think that's going to be one of the, the, uh, the points as we raise, raise this. Um, um, again, my, um, my other concern has been that we have, we'll have industry, we'll have the environmental community, we will not have um, small business representing um, and consumers being represented in this hearing. Um, uh, we're going to make an attempt to make sure their voices are heard. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Thank you, the gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for the purpose of asking questions. Um, thank you again, Ms. Newberg, for being here. I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, small users and the phase down. So uh, the, le the legislation requires a phase down in the production and consumption of the listed HFCs, and I take the gentleman's point about isomers. We'll follow up on that. By 85% over 15 years, it's not a ban. I think you've seen things like this in, the, in, in other um, contexts. When the phase down is complete in 2036, 15 percent of baseline levels of production and consumption will still be available. So Ms. Newberg, can you put the 15 percent amount in context? Is that a sufficient amount to allow small or niche users of uh, these materials to continue to use HFCs? Thank you very much. Um, there may be a couple points to that that are worth noting. Um, first, there are provisions that are included in here that seem to allow for additional production or consumption if there are needs that are going unmet. Mm -hmm. um, so that may be something that, that's there. In terms of the 15 In addition to the 15 percent, potentially. Additional. That, that is our read of what is written. Correct. Um, with regards to the 15 percent, for the ozone depleting substances, the phased outs have been complete to zero, and um, we have had, at times had to look at whether or not there were additional uses. Um, typically those were not for um, small business. It was more for human health, for example, um, for metered doses, meter dose inhalers for asthmatics. Um, and in those cases, we have always found a way to work with those uses. Um, from a point of view in terms of the percentage, the 15 percent number seems consistent with numbers that we looked at to ensure that we would not have to uh, look at any kind of additional amounts needed in order to service existing equipment, uh, ensure that equipment um, met its useful lifetime, and assure that if there were any niche applications that were either consumer-based or uh, military or others, that those uses could get met. And just to follow up then, if the 15 percent somehow isn't enough, there are other protections in the bill for small users who don't have substitutes available for their applications. Is that correct? That seems consistent with what's in the, the bill. Okay, good. Um, on the subject of developing substitutes for the use of HFCs, um, how has EPA considered lead times for transitions away from certain chemicals when acting under Title VI? In this particular space, chemicals are used in a wide variety of applications, so anywhere from an aerosol or a solvent wipe to foam products. Um, so for the ozone depleting substances, and, and HFCs are used in all of the same applications as their predecessor chemicals, we have seen lead times vary um, industry by industry, end use by end use, and without any specific uh, minimum time needed. Okay, so you do see variation. And then are there um, restrictions under Title VI on the import of HFCs at this time? There are no restrictions under Title VI for the import of HFCs. So if H.R. Uh, 55, 50, 5544 became law, imports of the HFCs to be phased down under the law would be subject to the allowance-based phase-down program. Is that true in your understanding? Our understanding is we would be establishing uh, an, an allowance-based program. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much. I don't have any more uh, questions, uh, so I will yield back and at this time recognize McMorris Rogers. I'm sorry, um, Ms. Ms. McMorris Rogers from uh, Washington for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. While a stated goal of this legislation is to provide certainty to U.S. companies to phase down the use of HFCs and to invest in next generation coolants, I'm concerned that this bill will just add to a growing patchwork of state laws phasing out these chemicals. This past year, Washington State, along with California and Vermont, passed legislation to phase them out. More states are expected to follow suit. 
Like other debates we are having in the committee, for example, on CAFE standards and privacy, having one national standard often makes the most sense for uh, providing that regulatory certainty. Ms. Newberg, I'm concerned about the danger of unrealistic, legally enforceable timelines and in increasing litigation. Does the agency believe 90 days is enough time for the agency to meet the listing requirements in Section 3A, including the requirement to list all isom isomers? Thank you very much for the question. The agency did provide technical assistance su suggesting that 180 days would be more appropriate and suggesting that the trigger not be based on publication in the Federal Register since publication is outside of our scope. Should the obligation to create such a list by the date, uh, date certain or to publish it, uh, should the obligation be a date certain um, or uh, a date to publish it in the Federal Register? Our technical assistance uh, indicated that we could, uh, we would be able to implement something that was within 180 days. Um, we did not, we did not suggest that we needed to have no date included in the in the bill. Why do you think it's important to have a date? I think that's up to Congress. But you're advising 180 days. We were advising 180 days as opposed to 90 days. That's right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't have any further questions. General Lady yields back. The chair now recognizes recognize the general lady from Delaware, Ms. Blunt Rochester, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I want to thank the members uh, who worked very hard on this legislation, HR 5544. And thank you, Ms. Newberg, for being here today and for the technical assistance that you provided on this legislation. Um, I'd like to begin with a few questions about how consumers will be affected. And um, my first question is uh, Have you evaluated the cost to consumers? of an uh, HFC phase down, and if so, what are the results of the agency's evaluation? So we have not provided, um, I'm sorry, we've not prepared a cost assessment of, of this particular bill. Okay. Do you intend to? We have not been asked to. Okay. Hmm. I think we might want to ask you to do that, huh? Okay. Would uh, this legislation, would this would this legislation result in consumers having to replace equipment using HFCs before the nat natural end of life for that equipment? For example, let's say my air conditioner is only a couple of years old. If this legislation passes, will I have to replace my uh, air conditioner? Now, in reading this bill and our understanding of the provisions, particularly the provisions in the section, uh, I believe it is in section six, uh, we do not believe that that would at all force anyone to um, replace their air conditioner before it reaches the end of its useful lifetime. So uh, what about for servicing my air conditioner? Will service technicians still have access to the HFC in my air conditioner if, for example, it needs to be topped up? Yeah, so again, looking at Section 6, it does appear that that section would promote recover, recycle, reuse of existing chemicals. I can say from our history on the um, ozone-depleting substances, we phased out of CFCs in 1996, and we still have CFCs available for servicing equipment. So the history shows that it should be available. Okay. And can you describe how this worked for the phase out of CFCs and HCFCs? And specifically, were there early equipment retirements necessary, or were there sufficient CFCs and HCFCs uh, available to continue servicing existing equipment? Based on looking at the programs that we have in place today, and those programs have been in place since the 1990s, we have not um, seen situations where uh, people have replaced equipment because they have not had access to CFCs or HCFCs. And the recovered um, CFCs and HCFCs need to meet the same purity standard as newly manufactured chemicals. And I understand that uh, refrigerant management, such as requiring the re that refrigerants be recovered and addressing leaks, is critical to minimizing emissions to the atmosphere of refrigerants like HFCs. Does Section 6 of the bill give EPA sufficient authority to address refrigerant management and work to minimize emissions? I believe our review of it seems to indicate that it would provide sufficient authority to s establish recovery, recycling, and reclamation programs. And under Title VI, does EPA currently address things like training for HVAC technicians, and is that done broadly, or does it have to be focused on an environmental focus? 
currently Title VI has provisions uh, that we've implemented that do require that technicians are certified to work on equipment that contains ozone depleting substances and non-exempt chemicals. Um, in those instances, the training is focused really much more on the environmental outcome. We, we don't see ourselves as establishing trade um, programs. Okay. And Ms. Newberg, we're obviously interested in making sure that this new regulatory program would be implemented efficiently and in coordination with existing requirements for regulated businesses, uh, such as under Title VI. Uh, with respect to Section 7 of the legislation, does EPA have sufficient authority to coordinate any regulations issued under Section 7 with other regulatory requirements? We did note in our technical assistance that language that was similar to language that's in Section 6 would be useful mm -hmm. um, to ensure that there was coordination and that we did not create duplicative requ requirements. And, and I want to thank you and just to ask a more broad question. Is it your expectation that if passed, EPA would implement this legislation by integrating and coordinating the HFC phase down with the existing regulatory structure of Title VI? I believe that's a question I would need to take back and we'd need to consider that um, within the agency, but I think based on what's here, a lot there are a lot of similarities to Title VI. Thank you so much for your testimony and I would close by just saying it's not often, especially in these times, that we see things that are bipartisan, members of both houses, both chambers, uh, in support and industry and advocates. And so I am strongly in support of this bill and I hope that uh, my colleagues will also recognize the time is now. Thank you. And I yield back. General Lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Ms. Newberg, thanks for being with us today. Um, and I know you already know this, the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol aims to phase down the use of HFCs, but has not been ratified by the United States. If the legislation before us today is enacted, what would still need to be done to align our domestic laws in a way that ensures full compliance with the uh, Kigali Amendment? Thank you very much, and I appreciate the question. We have not done an assessment of how this bill compares to Kigali, and uh, that process would be an interagency process that would include the Department of State. Okay. Um, how, how could this lack of full compliance affect U.S. interactions with other countries that have already ratified the agreement? Well, again, we haven't done an assessment of so that. You, so that, that would, you would address that issue in, in your assessment? I think that the process for um, determining whether or not uh, an international treaty and how that works with uh, domestic regulation, typically that's a process that's led by the Department of State. EPA certainly participates, but typically that's a Department of State-led process. Okay. Um, I'd like to get a better understanding of the language used in H.R. 5544, and, and if you can't answer some of these now, uh, just say so, and I'd appreciate an answer for the record if, if, uh, if, if we get to that point. Does H.R. 5544's definition of consumption allow an importing country to have established the same or similar requirements to those in the bill? I'm sorry, to allow an importing country? Yeah. I think I would need to take that back. Typically, we think about companies, not countries. Okay. All right. Uh, does H.R. 5544's definition of exchange value have clear direction for purposes of calculations under this Act, since other provisions provide for different calculations aside from the exchange value? I believe we provided some technical assistance with regards to different areas in the draft in the legislation that would um, rely on the exchange values. So we can go back and provide additional information if needed and see. But I think generally we've already pro we've already addressed that in the technical assistance. Okay. And does HR 5544's definition of produce, produced, and production? operate similarly to how EPA implements Title VI of the Clean Air Act when it comes to excluding regulated substances that were destroyed? We did make a suggestion in our technical assistance that um, some, there should be maybe an addition of a phrase at the end of that section just to be more clear that uh, destruction would be excluded. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield the remaining balance of my time to uh, 
uh, my colleague from Oklahoma, Mr. Mullen. Thank Gen you, Mr. Johnson. Gentleman's recognized. I'd like to address some of the stuff that Ms. Rochester, who's a good friend of mine, brought up. Ms. Newberg, are you in the HF HVAC business? I, I am not. You're not? Well, it's interesting to me how you could certainly ask questions or answer questions about refrigerant and about replacement parts. Uh, when she was asking you about service and repair, such as um, uh, have you seen that the equipment runs its full lifespan without replacing it? And you said, we have not seen that. Well, I have been in the business 20 years, actually 23 years. I have seen it. Because what happens is the R22, which is the ODS that's being phased out right now, and so I just, so you don't have to go back to council on this one, which you did the rest of them, but I appreciate you asking certain, or answer certainty some of these questions. The R22, when you do a replacement drop-in, what we call a drop-in of, of new refrigerant, what ends up happening is you lose 80% of the capacity of the unit. So if you go from R, uh, for a, from a R22 and you're going to do a drop-in of, like, say, a 421A, which I'm sure you're probably not familiar with that, or you're going to do a drop-in of a 422 or an R453A, what happens is you lose 80% of your capacity, and then your PSIs on your compressor runs at 136 PSI, which is your pressure at uh, 80 degree temperature day. And when you do your replacement, it, dr it jumps that PSI for your compressor to run up to 236 to 240 PSI, which burns out the unit with less efficiency and less capacity. So what happens is, yes, you do have to replace it. So when you talk about a phase out, you're talking about phasing out a system. 60 to 65% of all the systems out there right now are still running on R22, and we haven't even phased out R22, and we're supposed to be phasing it to, H, to the uh, 410A, and now you're saying we're going to phase it out. Sorry, Mr. There is Mullen, a problem. I, I'm, I'm going to reclaim my time. And gentlemen, the chairman, I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Soto, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Newberg, for being here today. I'm from Florida, and we have a lot of sun and obviously a lot of ACs and care deeply about the ozone layer and about uh, clean air. I wanted to ask you about Section 4 regarding monitoring and reporting. Does Section 4, as drafted, provide the EPA with all of the information that it would need to implement the phase-down? provide some technical assistance with regards to Section 4. Um, generally speaking, I think we did feel like the section did provide us um, with the information that the agency needed. Um, in a few instances, we noted that some of the information being requested, uh, we may already have that information, uh, particularly information with regards to the 1989 baselines. Uh, right, and I have my notes. You all have been co collecting it since that day. So to confirm, is the current requirement that persons subject to the reporting requirement report data for the baseline years of 2011, 2012, and 2013 helpful? Is that helpful to you all? I'm sorry. I, I may need to, to look back at that. Um, I believe for 2011 and 2013, uh, the information would be helpful in the sense that those are the years that are the baseline years. The agency has some information already p reported, but we did not feel that, um, that we necessarily would have a perfect set. We'd have to go back and look at that. So having something included would be helpful. I would direct your attention to Section 4, Paragraph D, entitled Coordination. Does this paragraph provide sufficient authority to EPA to allow for efficient integrated reporting between this legislation and existing reporting requirements? We believe that the, the paragraph on coordination was very helpful and would allow for us to streamline some of the reporting requirements. I appreciate your assistance, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Walden, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, uh, as you know, we've got this other subcommittee going on downstairs. so. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions, and, and hopefully they haven't already been asked, but Section 7 of H.R. 5544 calls for the EPA to engage in a negotiated rulemaking with the stakeholders and promulgate regulations on the sector level, meaning a limited list of stakeholders may participate. 
Since consumers are left out of this engagement, do you think it's appropriate to have the consumers' voices and not just the manufacturers made a part of this rulemaking discussion about the products they'll be able to buy? I believe in any rulemaking that the agency does, the participation by the public is always welcome and always encouraged. Um, we have, I have not personally had experience with a negotiated rulemaking, so that would be something I would want to check back as to how best we would make sure that um, other voices are heard in the process. All right. Um, Section 5D2 of H.R. 5544 allows any outside party to petition the agency to accelerate the scheduled phase down of HFCs. Section 7C of the bill allows any outside party to petition the agency to restrict the use of an HFC in a specific industry. It appears that if the agency grants these petitions, they automatically must issue regulations with the requested outcomes, thereby limiting public input. So do you believe it's clear how the petition process described in these sections and their subsequent rulemaking processes relate to one another? So the agency did provide technical assistance suggesting that in instances both where we grant and deny a petition, in both instances that information should be um, should be put in the Federal Register and should be in a more transparent way so that the public is aware of that. But do you think, uh, uh, well, when would the public have the opportunity for meaningful participation in that kind of decision making? I would probably need to go back and consult with our general counsel. Generally, in our rulemaking process, obviously we do provide comment periods. In this particular in instance with this language, I would want to go back and consult. It's an issue, question we have, so that would be helpful to know. And could either of these subsections be read to prejudge the outcome of a rulemaking process? We noted in our technical assistance that C4 could be read to, pre to prejudge the outcome, and we had suggested changes to that language on that basis. Did those changes get in incorporated into the draft? To my knowledge, they, were in, uh, they have not yet been incorporated. Okay. All right. I, I would yield to the yeah, ranking uh, member. Just to, to jump in so on your question, I think you're debating between the words uh, or the proposals of promulgating and promote. And I think if if an outside group can appeal, then and there's a ruling, a decision made that does exclude the public from that debate. Um, and I would hope that we wouldn't want to do that. And I would yield. Uh, yeah, no, I would hope that too. Um, and I don't, I can't imagine that's actually the intent of the authors. But it may be the consequence, which is why I think having additional time to fully consider these matters is, is pretty important. So with that, I would, I would yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chairman yields. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Dingle, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the committee ranking, or the chair and the ranking uh, minority for holding it and participating in this because I think this is very important legislation. I think that if you're not in your position, a lot of people that are watching this hearing probably don't understand a lot of what they're listening to. But it is, this is a good, strong bill. It does have bipartisan support. And it's important that we stay at the forefront of innovation uh, in this country, strengthen our economy, protect our consumers, and have, protect our environment at the same time. As um, Mr. Shimkus uh, asked earlier in his questioning, it is clear that the trans transition away from hydrofluorocarbons is already happening globally. And if we're to remain competitive, we can't afford to sit on the sidelines. Michigan's home to nearly 3,900 direct jobs in the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration industry. This bill would not only sustain those jobs and another 134, 500 manufacturing jobs in the United States, but it would create another 33,000 high quality American jobs. So I thank you for being here. I thank you for providing te testimony and your expertise. And I thank the second panel as well. So I want to ask a basic question because I think a lot of people don't understand this question. How do hydrofluorocarbons enter the environment? And why do they matter? Thank you. They, they are generally released um, at some point in time, either through, uh, if it's in an aerosol, then it's a direct release. If it's in an air conditioning or refrigeration equipment, then it would maybe leak out over time. Or if it were not properly recovered and recycled at the end of life from a piece of equipment, 
they it would be emitted as well. Um, there are other ways as well. Um, equipment that is then landfilled, sometimes the uh, degradation products over time will lead to emissions. And it's ending up in our air, our land, and our water, correct? Or at least our air and land. I am not familiar on the water side. All right. I'll take that back. And how did, would EPA go about promulgating a new regulation as directed in this bill to establish standards for the management of HFCs, as you also mentioned in your testimony? What the bill seems to be identifying is for the agency to promulgate notice and comment rulemakings, and we would do so um, following both the requirements to do that and using uh, information and availability through our partnership programs as well. Um, we talked about earlier, uh, my colleague Mr. Shimka has raised it, that the worldwide transition away uh, from HFCs is beginning. Are you aware of any other countries who are implementing uh, a regulatory framework to manage this transition successfully, and are there lessons learned? I'm certainly aware of a number of countries that are already implementing um, restrictions uh, and phase downs of HFCs. We have not evaluated whether or not there are lessons learned from those. Would it be a good idea to do that? <laughs> I'm sure we can take that back and uh, there's always, it's always a positive way to look at other countries and see what works and what doesn't work. And in your technical opinion, does HR 5544 give the EPA the necessary authority to phase down HFCs responsibly that provides both economic and environmental benefits? We have not evaluated the bill uh, in particular on either the economic or environmental benefits in, a, in any kind of specific way. It does appear to provide the authority that would be needed to phase down HFCs. Um, I thank you for those answers and I yield back my time. Gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Mullen, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> Can I go back to a question that was asked earlier too about licensings? Uh, Ms. Newberg, in, in starting with page 22, line uh, 23, it says regulations to, to control where appropriate any practice, process, or activity regarding the service, repair, disposal, or installation of equipment that involves a regulated substance or substitute for regulated substance that the EPA administrator basically would set those standards. You would be over the licensings of insulation, repair, service, everything. Are you guys prepared to take over the licensings of that? So Earlier you said, when Ms. Rochester asked the question, you said that you guys are already in that space. You're not in the space where I'm at for the install, repair. You're not, you're not in that space. Under Title VI of the Clean Air Act, there are regulations mm -hmm. today that do guide air conditioning service. About emitting. Repair. It's emitting, it's when it's released. That's where you guys enter, when we release the product that's it, being used, it's illegal. There are additional requirements on recovery, recycling, sure. and reclamation, including um, provisions that deal with servicing practices. But you're not into the repair side of it. When, you, when specifically, when this talks about licensing, that you're gonna be overseeing the regulations to control where appropriate, any practice, process, or activity, any, any practice, process or activity regarding the servicing, repair, or disposal, or the insulation. That's the whole product, that's everything. That's not the refrigerant at this point. You guys are in the refrigerant space, not in this. So I'll need to go back and consult and work through our congressional affairs to provide well, you a more- Well, a while ago when you was asked the question, you said that you guys are already in that space, and so I want to clarify, you're not in that space. We you're just in the refrigerant space, right? And underneath this, it gives you the authority to enter in broadly, more broadly into the licensing and uh, of, of service techs, of there, our technicians. So Title VI under se Section 608, we do have a licensing program. Not Title VI, I'm, I'm talking about this. Uh -huh. underneath, so underneath this, this gives you more broad authority, does it not? I would like to make sure I answer your question correctly. Mm -hmm. um, you asked about the licensing. So EPA does provide licenses for air conditioning and refrigeration technicians, both for motor vehicles and for stationary equipment. You, for the recovery of the refrigerant. For including servicing practices associated Not the with servicing practicing, because that comes from the, uh, our licensings that we do comes from uh, the construction industry board in the state of Oklahoma. And if we go to a different state, that's where our licensing comes from. Where you guys are over is when we start recovering 
or filling the refrigerant of the units. So I'm happy to take this back and work with our congressional affairs. Right. I believe the language is opening in our regulation, so it's opening the system, but I'm happy right. to Right, which confirm. is the refrigerant. When we open it, it's reclaiming the refrigerant. If you are asking if we have licensing on the elect electrical side, you, you're correct. I'm not correct. talking about the electrical side. I'm talking about what this says. It says any practice. And my whole point that I'm getting to is this, much, this is much more broader language than what it is, which opens the door for interpretation. So I, I'm not, I, I, I'm telling you where our licensing already comes from versus reading this. Now, going, going back, when we start talking about, um, we, we, we start talking about the, the recovery of the refrigerant. Is it illegal right now for the refrigerant to be released into the air? There is a prohibition in the Clean Air Act that prevents it. Right, and so what is the fine for that? Uh, I'll have to check with the- $5,000. I if we, it's five thousand dollars per occurrence, is what we would get fined according to our training from the EPA if we were to get caught releasing the refrigerant, and and so I say that because sixty-five percent of all the units that are out there right now are still on the old R22 system. Because when you asked questions earlier, you you were asked, can the system run its full cycle? Well, the full cycle is fifteen to twenty years, is what your system works. And, and they phase out, when you're phasing this stuff out, you phase out the parts to it too. That's why this has been getting phased out since the March or All protocol, but yet 65% of the system, 60 to 65% of the system, they're still working on the old system, the, R, the R22 system. And, and now we're already trying to phase out the new system to which is supposedly supposed to go to the 410A. What is the measurement that you're using to say that the 410A needs to be phased out too? Because in your testimony, you stated that um, while HFCs do not deplete the ozone layer, mo most FHCs are potent, green ga or potent green, uh, greenhouse gases. Wh how are you measuring that? Because there's m more of the systems right now are still using the old system. I'm sorry. Uh, the the what is the need Mr. to Millett, phase out? Mr. Millett, we'll ask her a question and allow her to answer it, but your okay, time's well, expired. She, I think she was asking. Okay. She was trying to, she wasn't entering. What is the, what is the purpose to phase out the FACs? What is causing the urgency to phase it out? Well, that's a, a question for Congress since this is, a, that's a policy question and I can only answer based on what I can interpret in the bill. What your question was regarding um, the measurement um, I believe what they, uh, uh, greenhouse gases, I believe was your question, and the list that they that seems to be being used is uh, an IPCC list of greenhouse gas um, substances and their potency. With regards to your question on fines, I believe it's more like 50,000, but I would need to check that. I believe it's 50,000 per incident per day is the, the maximum fines, but that's it the depends question. on the group. gentleman's time has expired. Report. The chair now recognizes yeah. Mr. C uh, Mr. Carter from Georgia for five minutes. <clears throat> Ms. Newberg, thank you for being here. We appreciate you being here very much. Ms. Newberg, I want to ask you about the, you're obviously very familiar with, thank you, with the um, Kill Algae, um, Kig Alley, is that the way you Kigali. pronounce it? Kig Alley, Kig Alley. That, Kigali is the way you pronounce it in Geechee. That's what we speak down in South Georgia, okay? <laughs> and, and pay no attention to my colleagues up here on the dais. But uh, nevertheless, I, you know, help me understand this. I'm, I'm a pharmacist. I'm not in, in, this, in this area necessarily. But I just want to understand the, the difference, the, the basic difference between the HFCs and the HFOs and how they differ in utilization. Between the HFCs and the HFOs, right. the HFOs are another class of substitute chemicals. There are a lot of substitutes for ozone depleting substances. They're not all HFCs. They're not all HFOs. Hydrocarbons, carbon dioxide, um, many other types of chemicals have been used, methylene. Uh, right. So uh, how much do we know about the, the HFOs? I think that may be a question. I, I, I think the question that was asked earlier about it, how can you measure this if, you, if we haven't been using them, that's, that's my, what I'm concerned with here. So HFCs have been used in the United States since at least the early 90s, probably certainly before then. They've been used in a variety of uses uh, for a very long time. They're not new chemistry from that perspective. Okay, one last question, and that is, uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to ask um, unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter from the National Marine Manufacturers Association. Mm -hmm. 
Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. And one thing, one point that the um, boat makers make is that they do not have an option now, an alternative, if they are not using the HFCs for certain parts of the boats. Now they have decreased; they've decreased their use of them, 80 to 90 percent. However, it adds to the weight on it if they don't use the HFCs, and therefore they use more fuel. Are we not just shooting ourselves in the foot here if we? try to solve one problem, but we create another problem? I think there's a policy question in there that, that <coughs> has to be taken up in uh, how this legislation is developed. But in terms of your question on whether or not they have alternatives or any group has alternatives, I think the way this is structured in the legislation is that is something that we would look at a sector by sector basis. and. The technical assistance we provided is that we should actually cut that even finer and not just look at the sector, but look at the individual end uses because foams used in boats is going to be different than foams used, for example, in chairs or foams used in building insulation. So what you're telling me is you may have exemptions? exceptions? I believe the legislation is set up both to allow for that and also the gradual phase down means that different sectors could go at very different times. Okay. I'm going to yield the rest of my time to the gentleman from Oklahoma. What is the reason for the change to phase out 410A to A2L? So A2L is a de designation by ASHRAE as to types of refrigerant. It's not a specific type. There are a number of refrigerants that are both the, HFCs and non-HFCs that would meet that designation. But to phase out from the 410L to the new refrigerant that we're going to, what is the need for that? What is, why, why do we feel the need for it if it's not depleting the ozone? Well. I mean, I noted in my testimony they are put in greenhouse gases, but I believe that's a question for the. the but the it, but it isn't the isn't bill. the A2L isn't it flammable? The refrigerant that we're going to, we go from a non-flammable refrigerant to a flammable re re uh, refrigerant. Is that not true? So there are both flammable and non-flammable refrigerants in use broadly today, including you mentioned for but DNA. But the one that we're the one that we're specifically talking about that we use daily each day inside customers' air conditioners, consumers. It's non-flammable. I believe you are referencing a particular product. The 410A to which we're going out, to which we're phasing out, because it's part of the FHCs, we're phasing that out. And we're going to a flammable, to the manufacturer says, a mildly flammable refrigerant. Is that not accurate? I don't believe there's anything in that legislation that dictates a specific choice on what. Well, that's the, but that's the direction that we're going to. That's what the manufacturers are fa phasing out to. The manufacturers are even claiming that it's mildly flammable. So I, I believe there are a full range of flammable, non-flammable, and mildly flammable alternatives. It would depend on the end use and the manufacturer. Not widely used right now. We're not putting flammable, flammable refrigerant in consumers' homes. I believe in certain products we are. Uh, not refer for refrigerant, we're not putting them in because we're not allowed to. I'm not allowed to put those in. The only way they can come in is they come in with a closed loop system and then we're not allowed to work on those. That takes a whole nother classification. I'll yield back. Gen gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I'd, I'd really like to give more of the time uh, to uh, Representative Mullen to continue his question, if he could, please. Yeah, Gentlemen yield to him. Yeah, okay. Come, coming back to the to the question that I was asking, um, to to reference it again, and I'll try to give you more time to answer it here. It, if if we're still using the old old system, which is the R22, if we're still using the old, old system and 60 to 65 percent of all the air conditioners that are still in customers' homes that are being used today and, and only 30 to 35 percent of the systems are running on the, on the H, uh, HFCs, which is the 410A system for customers that are running refrigerant. My whole point that I'm trying to get to is, does it seem reasonable that we're phasing out the 410As when they're not even widely used yet? So we really don't have a way to measure what their impact is on the environment. Would you say that's accurate? So we have not installed new equipment in the United States, at least not legally, since 2010 using R22. Since that no, time, all right. It's there was a complete phase out in 2015. You couldn't even buy replacement parts in 2015, and then of course in 20. 20 this year, 
you can't even buy the drop-in refrigerant anymore for what we call for the R22s. So R22 is available today, and it's just not newly manufactured. It's recovered and recycled. It's still available today. It has not been available for new equipment since 2010. Right. And then I think to answer your other question, um, the agency hasn't approved any um, A2L refrigerants for split systems for, I believe what you're talking about is what we would commonly in call a central air conditioning. Mm -hmm. We have not ap approved an A2L refrigerant for that application to date. Well, the, the manufacturers are already saying that the phase out, the replacement for the 410A will be the A2L, and they openly say that it's mildly flammable. A2L is an ASHRAE designation I know that, that would be mildly flammable, but my understanding, and I'm not, I think you have a panel coming up of industry experts, so you may be better off having that conversation with them. Well, but we're talking about the environment. My whole point that I'm trying to get to, is it really safe? Is it really safe for us to be going to a non-flammable to a flammable when the product that we have right now is, is safe to be in a home, it's not ozone depleting, it's against the law to release it, we have to recover it, we have to measure it. Uh, for your account, you're saying 50,000, for our account, it's 5,000, depending on what level of claims that you're bringing into it, for the fines to be able to release it, and all I'm saying is the, co the consumer is the one that's getting hit with this. Because when you replace the system, the system for a three-ton unit, which is the average for a average home inside the United States, the replacement cost is roughly $6,500. For a five-ton system, which is what you have in a lot of Midwest because the homes are slightly larger, the replacement cost is a roughly $10,000. So that's today. And so I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out what is the consumer benefit of this. We're we're going to cost the consumer to switch to a new system that's going to be already out in another 15 years. So we're going to take out, we're going to say you can't put in the R22 systems anymore, so you got to go to the 410A systems. And by the way, when you put that 410A system in it, by the time it's going to start needing repairs, which is about 15 years, it's not going to be able to be repaired, and you're going to have to replace the system again to the new A2L, which, by the way, that's flammable. We're going to put, now we're going to put a flammable product into your system. How is, how is that best for the consumer? It, it, when you start talking about, uh, the, according to you, the 410L or 410A isn't ozone depleting, what's the measurable reason, the reason then that we'd put the consumer safety at risk over a possible greenhouse gas potential leak? So I, I think if you, we'd be happy to follow up here in my Congressional Affairs Office and provide you with information on refrigerant safety. But that's not answering the question. Is it, in your opinion, is that the right way to do, to put, to switch, to, to go from a non-flammable product to a mildly flammable product? I believe that's a question that I can take back and work with you with our congressional affairs to provide okay. you with information. Okay, with that, I'll yield back. Uh, gentleman yields, uh, Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Flores, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Newberg, thanks for joining us today. I have uh, two quick questions for you. Um, in Section 5, uh, there's an outline for a timeline for the phase down of regulator regulated substances, uh, but that uh, timeline also allows exemptions under certain circumstances. And so my question is this. Do you believe that Section 5 is clear when it comes to specifying uh, for when and what and why exemptions would be allowed under the HFC phase down? Thank you. I believe we provided in our technical assistance, and I'm just looking now, that um, we did believe that there were some small changes that could be made to make that a little bit more clear and connect that information. Okay, great. I appreciate that. My next question builds on um, the question that uh, GOP leader uh, Walden uh, was asking about Section 7. Uh, there's an evaluation provision um, that's designated as E under Section 7 for technology transitions. Um, it's clear in that provision that the EPA shall consider the availability of alternatives uh, to regulated substances for potential rulemaking procedures. And so my question in this regard is what would help um, facilitate this process uh, and also to make sure that there is transparency for the public in this process? Thank you. I appreciate the question, and, and I'll note that one of the conditions that the EPA is supposed to look at is safety in particular. 
Um, I believe we provided technical assistance that also noted for more transparency, what might be helpful is for um, some language to be added in, um, language that could be consistent with Title VI on a clearinghouse, which would be just for uh, folks to understand what alternatives we're looking at in terms of availability. Okay, great. I appreciate the uh, responses on that. I'm going to yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Muller. Ma'am, I'm sorry you and I get to talk so much. It's just that this is a very passionate point for me because at the end of the day, the, the consumer, I think, is the one that is, that is being left out of this conversation. I know we've, we've heard uh, from different people up here that they said it's rare that the manufacturers and the chamber uh, come together on an agreement, but as uh, our uh, ranking member Shimkus pointed out, that the small businesses and the customer the consumer, our constituents, are left out. And the whole thing that I'm trying to get to is, is we talked about certainty inside the industry through regulation, but what about the uncertainty to the consumer? As I said, we haven't even completely finished out the phase out of the R22. And I go back to, 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 uh, to the same question, I can't figure out what the need is if we haven't already phased out the, four, the R22 to the 410A, what is the need to go ahead and phase out the HFCs, which is the 410A? What is, what, your expert opinion, what is driving the need to do this? I appreciate the question, and I do believe that is a question for the drafters of the bill. It is a, it's a policy question as to right. what the rent would be. Okay, well, do you, in, your, in your opinion, do you feel like there's an actual need to phase out uh, HFCs? I'm not here in my personal capacity. I'm here as a, a representative of my agency and providing technical well, assistance on draft legislation. I, I understand that, but the but the, the 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 drafters of the bill was was pointing towards the environment, I and understand. you are the EPA. If the gentleman would yield, yes, um, I've been in this position numerous times. Uh, She's not supposed to give her personal opinion. She's okay. just supposed to comment on the legislative language of the bill and whether it can be enacted or it can't. Okay, or I'll rephrase other. my question then. Is, 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 there a measure, is there a concern with the EPA that 410A is, is, is hurting the environment? The agency already has regulations on 410A um, because of recovery recycling and to prevent the venting of the refrigerant. But do you feel like the 410A, the FHCs, are hurting the environment? It's the agency made a determination that it was a not exempt from the venting prohibition, that it needed to be recovered sure. and recycled under Section 608. I'm sorry, it needed to be um, rec not vented. But with the recycling going on, is HFCs hurting the environment? So the agency made a determination in 2001 that there that it was not exempt, meaning it did it did not find that there was no environmental impact. In other words, we found there was an impact. Otherwise, we would have exempted it from the Section 608 prohibition. That's back from 2001. That's right. back since 2001 and before then. The agency had determined, based on what Congress gave us in the Clean Air Act under Section 608 that we could not allow the releases during surface maintenance, repair, and disposal of air conditioning refrigeration equipment. Okay, gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for five minutes. Yeah, thank the chair, and welcome to our witness. Um, Ma'am, my home in Southeast Texas, I've lived there since 1972. <laughs> now I'm a Texan, so I don't talk funny like my friend from Georgia, but, <coughs> We moved there, we had one car, a 1963 Chevy um, station wagon with no AC. That car was in my family for maybe two days maximum in Texas. We cannot live without air conditioning. The forecast in Hughes, Southeast Texas is the same from late April to mid-October. It's 95 degrees or more and 95% humidity or more. Without air conditioning, my home region would not be the fastest growing region in the country with Houston, Texas about to become the third biggest city in America. The Texas Medical Center, Texas Children's Hospital in the Medical Center, 
Indian Anderson Cancer Center, all those great research places for kids to get care, cancer cured, they would not be here with air, air conditioning. The eighth wonder of the world, a building called the Houston Astrodome, was solely built for air conditioning. Had a little park out there called Colts Park, outside, heat, humidity, they could not play there. The mosquitoes were as big as flies, they kept swarming. So my point is, air conditioning is a part of our life that we have to have in Houston, Texas. We just replaced my air conditioner in my house. Have two ACs, had to replace one because it got old. My question is, if this bill becomes law, do I have to replace my air conditioner within 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, or can I keep it as long as it's working? You do not need to replace it. You can keep it as long as it is working. Okay, that's good news for my wife. I want to talk about the commercial aspect. As I mentioned in my opening statement, a company called Daikon, which is a Japanese company that's got 7,000 people working in Texas 22, they make air conditioners. Their sales last year, $17 billion. They operate in 150 countries. Their art research and development budget last year, $300 million. They've been in business now since 1924, 96 years. My question is, if this bill does not become law, what happens to DICON here in America? Can they stay here? Will they stay here? Or will they be forced to go overseas because we can't compete with old laws? I appreciate the question. I, I don't think I could speak to the ramifications on any particular uh, company or business based on the legislation. We haven't done that type of analysis. But you said in your statement that lots of countries right now overseas are switching to, you know, getting rid of this, the, the uh, CFCs, and we're behind that curve. So if we don't adapt and give a phase defined timeline, does that hurt a company like DICON that wants to stay here that may have to go somewhere else because the whole world is doing something with HC, uh, HFCs and we're not? I appreciate the question, and it, it may be better to for the industry or others to weigh in on that more than from EPA's perspective. I think what we have seen before and what we've spoken to is the time, the time differences could impact different industries in different ways, but we haven't done any analysis on a particular company. And this is not something new, right? EPA has done this in the past where you phase in some new, some new process or some new, some new chemical. We talked about what we did the last time with the, uh, you know, the uh, Montreal Protocol. This is nothing new, right? Not a big deal for EPA to adapt, correct? Um, I, so Title VI of the Clean Air Act set in motion for EPA implementation of the Montreal Protocol and phase out of alternatives as well as, um, sorry, phase out of the ozone depleting substances and identification of alternatives. The legislation does seem to request the agency to do many of the same activities. So again, we've been down this road once before. It's not some radical path we're going down right now with this bill. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to offer unanimous consent of uh, four documents of support for the record. The first one is from five senators, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Cassidy, uh, Ms. Collins, Mr. Cotton, and Mr. Graham. The second one was mentioned by my colleague from Georgia. It's from the National Marine Manufacturers Association. The fourth is from the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce and National Association of Manufacturers. And the fourth one is from the Americans for Tax Reform, Freedom Works, and the ACCF, the American Council for Capital Formation. Without objection, those will be ordered. Thank you. I yield back. Okay, the gentleman's time, uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, that concludes our first panel. I would like to thank Ms. Newberg for joining us today. Thank you for being here. Uh, I would like to uh, recognize that Mr. Olson cannot not talk about the Astros no matter what happens. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, we, we can got talk caught. about the Astros. Amazing. We can talk about Amazing. it. It just, no matter what happens, he's got to mention the Astros. Um, at this time, I'd ask the staff to prepare the witness table so we can begin our second panel shortly, and the committee's in recess for five minutes.
push that to make it work. All right, I'll call the committee to order. We're um, now ready for our second uh, panel. And I will now um, introduce the witnesses. Uh, thank you all for being here very much. Um, uh, Mr. John Galen is president of Danfoss North America, who is testifying on behalf of the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Re Refrigeration Institute. Ben Lieberman, senior fellow, Competitive Enterprise Institute. And I understand, Mr. Lieberman, you spent some time with this committee before, so welcome back. Uh, Mr. David Doniger, Senior Strategic Director of Natural Resources Defense Council. Mr. Gary Bedard, President and Chief Operating Officer of Lennox International, who is testifying on behalf of the Alliance for Responsible Atmospheric Policy. Before we begin, um, just an explanation about the lighting system. In front of you are a series of lights. The light will initially be green. The light will turn yellow when you have one minute left. Please begin to wrap up your testimony at that point. The light will turn red when your time expires. At this time, Mr. Galen, you are recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Shimkus and the members of the subcommittee. As already stated, my name is John Galleon, and I'm the chairman of the board of directors at the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute, the Trade Association of Manufacturers of HVACR and Water Heating Equipment. AHRI's more than 300 member companies manufacture quality efficient and innovative residential and commercial air conditioning, space heating, water heating, and commercial refrigeration equipment and components for sale in North America and around the world. AHRI member companies produce more than 90 percent of the previously named equipment used uh, here and around the world. I also serve as president of Danfoss North America, a manufacturer and a member company of AHRI. Thank you for this opportunity to provide comments on this important bill. The companies in this industry with significant business and manufacturing operations here in the United States are among the recognized world leaders in HVACR technology with decades of substantial investments in innovation and R&D that has enabled us to lead and support successful transitions in refrigerant technologies over the past 30 years. I would like to highlight that the swift enactment of the AIM Leadership Act would establish a federal framework to guide the transition out of the group of substances known as hydrofluorocarbons, commonly referred to as HFCs, into the next generation technologies, many of which are made here in the United States. HFCs are used as refrigerants as well as solvents 
foam blowing agents, propellants, fire suppressants, and aerosols. Some have asked, why is federal legislation needed to phase down HFCs? Without federal legislation or passage of this bill, we face a disorderly transition that puts American industry and innovation at risk. This will add significantly more cost and complexity that will be especially burdensome for small and mid-sized businesses that have limited resources and without the scale to absorb the incremental investments required. Many of the new technologies needed in the transition will be developed here in the United States, which can be a major advantage for American business, workers, and consumers. However, there is a big difference between an orderly transition guided by federal legislation and a disorderly transition, which will occur in the absence of a federal framework. With an orderly transition, the American HVACR industry has certainty, stability, and predictability with regard to product lines, supply chains, distribution networks, and legal and regulatory requirements. This will enable businesses to invest and innovate. This is where all the economic benefits come from. 33,000 new jobs, 12 billion in direct manufacturing output, and a 25% increase in exports. In an orderly transition, we have a pretty clear, clear picture of how to manage the HFC transition, and we can plan, invest, hire, and build accordingly, and to transition in a shorter time frame. In a disorderly transition, where there is no federal framework, it is likely that chaos will prevail, and it's uncharted water for us since all prior refrigerant transitions were all guided by an early federal framework. In a disorderly transition, a company, in order to remain competitive, will have to maintain multiple product lines without a national framework. This complexity would extend into supply chains, warehousing, distribution networks, and significantly increase the cost of regulatory compliance. A smaller company may be forced to compete in some regions and not in others due to the extra costs and complexity. The AIM Leadership Act puts us on a path for an orderly transition away from HFCs. The American HVACR manufacturing industry and the AHRI member companies are in strong support of the AIM Leadership Act. NAM and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce also support H.R. 5544. We believe it would create regulatory certainty, stability, and predictability. This protects the interests of large and small manufacturers and all consumers, while also encouraging new technology investment and development that would result in jobs creation and increased trade. I urge Congress to act swiftly in the passage of this bill for the benefit of American manufacturers, workers, and consumers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I welcome any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Gallian. Uh, Mr. Lieberman, you're now recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Chairman Tonko, Vice Chairman Peters, Mr. Shimkus, and members of the subcommittee. Ben, pull that a little bit closer to you. You think I'd know that by now, but. You would think. Thank you for this invitation to speak today at this hearing on H.R. 5544, the American Innovation and Manufacturing Leadership Act of 2020. My name is Ben Lieberman, and I'm a senior fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy institute committed to advancing the principles of free markets and limited government. Before that, I had the distinct privilege of being a staff member for the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, including work on this subcommittee from 2011 to 2018. Now, I know that a number of you have expressed misgivings about the Green New Deal or carbon taxes or other comprehensive climate change measures, and I certainly share those misgivings. But I also know that several of you are casting about for something you can support on climate, something less controversial and costly, the proverbial low-hanging fruit or win-win proposal. And it appears that some of you may be gravitating towards H.R. 554, the American Innovation and Manufacturing Leadership Act of 2020, as possibly being that vehicle. But I would strongly caution against doing so. I believe that this bill, especially in its present form, risks imposing significant and unnecessary costs on homeowners, vehicle owners, and many small business owners, 
and promises more economic pain than environmental gain. The bill places limits on production of hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs. These are the refrigerants currently used in literally hundreds of millions of air conditioning and refrigeration systems. Nearly every vehicle air conditioner, many residential air conditioners and refrigerators, and the equipment used in millions of small businesses, such as restaurants, for example. Future repairs of this equipment, and particularly repairs of leaks that require additional HFCs, would very likely rise if supplies of these refrigerants become restricted. In addition, the cost of HFC substitute refrigerants and the equipment designed to use them is also likely to be higher. For example, perhaps the most common HFC targeted under the bill is HFC 134A, which is the stuff used in your car air conditioner and refrigerator, as well as quite a bit of the equipment you might see at a food store. Well, you can go to any of a number of online supply houses and find 134A for around $5 to $7 a pound, even less if you buy it in bulk. But its substitute, something called HFO1234YF, can be found on those same sites for something closer to $50 per pound. So make no mistake, this bill will impose costs, both higher repairs of existing equipment and a higher purchase price for new equipment. Now, there are a few provisions in this bill that are particularly problematic, and I'd like to spend a moment highlighting them. This includes the provision that lets the deadlines be accelerated. The bill sets out a schedule of a 40% reduction of HFCs by 2024 and an 80% reduction by 2034. Not great, but not terrible in terms of pr allowing for a gradual transition. But the bill allows these deadlines to be accelerated. And even if EPA chooses not to do so, the bill's wide open litigation opportunities practically guarantee that environmental groups will sue to do so. This provision destroys any certainty and could lead to HFC restrictions far costlier than originally set out for all those pieces of equipment that will still need it. At a minimum, I believe that any policy um, change should allow the existing generation of HFC-dependent equipment to live out its useful life relatively undisturbed without higher costs to be re replaced in due course by whatever comes next. And this bill, in its present form, falls well short of that goal. I also see problems with the lack of state preemption. Many of the issues I work for on this committee, such as CAFE standards and appliance efficiency standards, were complicated by California and other states going in their own direction, often for the express purpose of trying to force the issue in Washington. And that's already happening with CFs, HFCs. However, this bill does nothing to rein in states that want to continue setting conflicting HFC measures. I think one set of HFC restrictions would be enough of a challenge. We don't need a m multiplicity of uh, requirements. I'd also add that the bill's exceptions are far too narrow and do not provide relief should compliance costs prove to be high, especially for small businesses and consumers, or if other issues like the flammability concerns that were touched on um, are not resolved in time. This bill would be uncharted territory in a number of respects, so there should be a safety valve if things don't go quite as well as proponents are predicting. In conclusion, there are a number of things that could be done to uh, improve this, this bill. But I should add that I'm not yet convinced that a bill is necessary. To, to put it bluntly, what would be so okay. bad if the new stuff had to compete with the old stuff? Mr. Lieberman, you can conclude. And, uh, and let consumers decide for themselves. That's the way it usually works when the new product is introduced. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this hearing and look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. Mr. Doniger, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, for the opportunity to testify. And thank you to the co-sponsors of this bipartisan legislation to phase down harmful hydrofluorocarbons and help U.S. companies lead the world in replacing them with innovative and climate-friendly alternatives. I'm David Doniger. I help lead the climate and clean energy program of the Natural Resources Defense Council, and I've worked in this area for more than 30 years to safeguard the ozone layer and the climate from the fluorocarbon family of chemicals. Under the Montreal Protocol and the 1990 Clean Air Act, we successfully phased out the CFCs that were depleting the stratospheric ozone layer, and if we had not eliminated CFCs, humanity would have suffered hundreds of millions of skin cancers, millions of them fatal, 
as well as cataracts and immune disorders, and huge agricultural losses over th this century. You can see how bad it would have been in the one-minute NASA video that I linked to in my testimony. But thanks to U.S. bipartisan leadership uh, under President Reagan and every president since and the Congress, the ozone layer will recover in the lifetime of my children. Phasing out CFCs is also the most effective step we've taken so far to slow climate change. And that's because CFCs are also extremely powerful greenhouse gases, some more than 10,000 times the heat trapping power pound for pound of carbon dioxide. If we had let CFCs keep growing, the climate change impacts we're feeling now, heat waves, droughts, wildfires, storms, flooding, sea level rise, would have hit us 10 years ago and they'd be even worse today. HFCs were an initial replacement for CFCs. They don't harm the ozone layer, they have lower heat trapping power. So they were a, a step in the right direction on climate change. But not enough because HFCs themselves still have hundreds <coughs> to thousands of times the heat trapping power of CO2. And HFC emissions are growing much more rapidly than CO2. If HFCs keep growing, they could add nearly another half degree Celsius, that's nearly a full degree Fahrenheit, to the global average temperatures we'll experience by 2100. In a world now on track for at least a three degree cel Celsius rise and struggling to find the policies to hold warming to one and a half or even two degrees, we cannot afford to add another half degree of new warming on top of everything else. So that is the imperative for replacing HFCs with climate friendly, friendlier alternatives. Fortunately, this is an area of consensus and cooperation between the industries that make and use these chemicals and the environmental community. And industry leaders have pioneered a wide range of alternatives, some new, some old, that can do the jobs HFCs do effectively, safely, and economically, with much less, and in some cases, nearly zero impact on the climate. The transition has started, but as with CFCs, we need the framework of an orderly phase down under federal law. And that's why both industry and environmentalists are here today to testify in support of H.R. 5544. The bill does three main things. It sets a schedule for reducing the production and import of HFCs, and I emphasize the import because there are no restrictions on imports from China and other countries now. It requires recovering reusable chemicals and reducing leaks. It provides for replacing HFCs in end uses where safer alternatives are available. It is not often that the committee hears support for the same bill from all sides, from the environmental community, from the chemical makers and equipment suppliers, from business organizations like the Chamber of Commerce, and the National Association of Manufacturers. Again, we applaud Representatives Tonko, Olson, Peters, and Stefanik for their bipartisan leadership and invite all of you to join in this bill. We note that the Senate Companion Bill currently has 32 co-sponsors drawn equally from both parties. I will close by noting that American industries have led in bringing new alternatives and new products to the multi-hundred billion dollar international marketplace in these technologies. If we sustain that leadership, that will mean more manufacturing investment and jobs here in America and more American exports. But American firms need the encouragement and certainty of this bill. Companies in Europe, Japan, and China are already working to catch up. This legislation will enable our country to retain its environmental leadership and our industries to maintain their commercial edge and reap the rewards. That's why environmentalists and industry alike support enacting this legislation now. <coughs> I'd be happy to answer your questions. We now recognize Mr. Bedard, I believe, for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Tonko, Ranking Member Shimkus, and members of the committee. I'm Gary Bedard, the President and Chief Operating Officer of Lenox International's global refrigeration business. And today I speak on behalf of the Alliance for Responsible Atmospheric Policy in support of H.R. 5544, the American Inno Innovation and Manufacturing Leadership Act. The Alliance is an organization of industry users and producers of fluorocarbon compounds established in 1980. 
Today, the Alliance represents businesses that produce and use HFCs in air conditioning, refrigeration, appliances, foam, electronics, aerosols, and metered dose inhalers. Lennox International is based in Richardson, Texas, and employs 10,000 people, many of whom work in American manufacturing or engineering facilities in Georgia, Iowa, Texas, South Carolina, Arkansas, and Mississippi. American industry has invested billions in the development of low GWP compounds and technologies and led the global development of policies to achieve a cost-effective transition to lower GWP technologies. Our future is dependent upon a rational federal transition to low GWP refrigerants. The AIM Leadership Act facilitates an efficient and cost-effective domestic phase-down of HFC refrigerants by providing narrow authority to the EPA to transition to new substances. The alternative is an inefficient process that increases costs for manufacturers, distributors, contractors, and ultimately consumers, your constituents. The most economical transition is a predictable and rational federal transition. The AIM Leadership Act relies on three key components a market-based allocation system that gradually phases down production, a flexible program for user sectors with no impact on, user, on existing equipment owners, and improved management of refrigerants. We successfully manage prior transitions, yielding significant consumer benefits and environmental improvements. Independent analysis estimates a federal transition will stimulate additional domestic investment, generating 33,000 manufacturing jobs over the first decade while increasing exports by $5 billion. This legislation simplifies a complicated regulatory structure using known policy approaches with some key improvements from lessons learned. The AIM Leadership Act advances American-made technology, provides economic benefits, and significant job growth while facilitating American leadership globally. A federal program also curtails illegal dumping of HFCs into the U.S. as is currently occurring, particularly from countries like China. This transition is well underway globally. More than 90 countries, including all of our major economic competitors, have a defined policy approach. The only debate remaining is the timing of the transition in the United States, the efficiency by which it occurs, and whether our industry maintains its global leadership in a market that is expected to double in the next 10 years. The domestic HVAC in our industry is lagging and falling behind both the EU and Asia as a result of uniform federal policy, a lack of uniform federal policy. Failure to pass this legislation into law significantly increases our regulatory burden ensuring a costly localized refrigerant transition. This means industry will manufacture redundant product lines, increase our distribution costs, and reduce our inventory turns. Failure to pass this legislation means inefficiency wins over innovation, and American industry, workers, and consumers lose to foreign competition. Conversely, this legislation reduces regulation to a single, rational, efficient, and cost-effective federal program. We strongly support smart federal policy that enables American industry to win globally. We believe that is what H.R. 5544 offers us. The AIM Leadership Act is supported by industry, the National Association of Manufacturers, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and the NRDC. We should take advantage of this rare, broad-based advocacy. Historically, Title VI programs have experienced broad bipartisan support as a similar legislative proposal in the Senate, S-2754, currently enjoys. We hope that this legislation will also receive bipartisan support in the House of Representatives. The AIM Leadership Act provides regulatory simplification, implements smart market-based and flexible approaches that have proved cost-effective over the years and are projected to do so in the future. It is pro-jobs, pro-trade, pro-American technology leadership, and pro-environment. It deserves strong bipartisan support, and we hope you will give it favorable package. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bedard, and all of the members of the panel for your testimony. We'll now move to member questions, and I'll start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Bedard, I mentioned the um, broad support from the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration industry for this legislation. Can you help us better understand the breadth of that support? Does it sure. include the entire supply chain from chemical and equipment manufacturers down to contractors? Just 
I'll let us better understand sure. the impact. Um, uh, Chairman, I, I think uh, if you look at the uh, AHRI, which represents the manufacturers as well as the chem chemical manufacturers, again, I, I talked about the alliance that I'm representing here today. Obviously, the chemical manufacturers are part of that. But I think uh, also included, um, you know, small business, the Air Conditioning Contractors Association has uh, submitted a letter. Of course, there's small businesses. There's not a, uh, a district in the country that doesn't have a small uh, air conditioning contractor in, in their district, and they are supportive through their, through their trade association. The wholesalers, those whom we sell to that then in turn sell to contractors, are represented by Hardy, um, the wholesaler uh, uh, group. And they also have provided um, support for it, as well as the sheet metal and air conditioner contractors, SMACNA, of, of North America. All of those organizations have submitted letters in support of this bill. So there's also considerable private sector support outside of your industry, and obviously you mentioned the um, various end users and refrigerant consumers that will benefit uh, from an orderly transition uh, to this next generation uh, refrigerant. That is correct, and, and from a consumer point of view, um, obviously we're a manufacturer. We're very, very concerned about costs. We understand the costs that refrigerants have in the product. Um, frankly, they are a small part of the cost of the product, and um, we have evaluated this bill and we've evaluated um, the, the timing, and we feel very comfortable that with the kind of roadmap that this bill provides, uh, that we'll be able to perform as we have in the past. Uh, and frankly, we've been able to take the cost out and the consumers have, have received better product, in many cases more efficient product, uh, for similar costs. Thank you. It is a little unusual for us to receive testimony from industry stakeholders asking for the creation of a new EPA program. Uh, so, Mr. Gallion, uh, are American manufacturers currently making investments to develop HFC substitutes? Yeah, most certainly, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, they are and have been for the last uh, 10 years. And, and most of us are also servicing not only the U.S. Is it on? Maybe I just need to get closer. Good. Um, that, that we have been investing, in fact, more than 10 years uh, to meet the North American requirements, but it's also moving, as it's already talked about. Globally, there's a transition that's underway today to move away to, uh, to, to more uh, to different uh, chemical alternatives to the HFCs. So, yes, and we've been leading in the U.S. This is also a key point. So we've been leading in that area. We've been leading here in the U.S., and that's transitions to larger market shares and, and business for us internationally. And so does an orderly transition to next generation refrigerants, as was done with the phase down of ozone depleting substances, provide the certainty or grow that certainty necessary to continue to make those investments in the U.S. so that these HFS substitutes will be American made? Without question. So, you know, I represent uh, today the, the 300 member companies that manufacture for the North America, as I made in my testimony. We represent 90 percent of the equipment that's produced and sold here in the U.S., and we're prepared uh, to make this transition. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Doniger, you have worked on these issues for decades. How has the phase down of ozone depleting substances uh, informed your position, and did that program benefit both industry and the environment? Well, we learned a great deal from that experience. In the uh, early 80s, the people on this panel were at odds with one another. And in about the mid-80s, we came uh, to a way of dealing with one another on a partnership basis. Uh, NRDC asked for a phase out of the CFCs over a period of time rather than an immediate ban. And the industries began to uh, cooperate in the design and, and uh, of that system. They had alternatives. They had the expertise. And we worked, we've worked together for 30 years uh, on a successful phase out of the CFCs, the HCFCs, and now hopefully the HFCs. Um, uh, this is really uh, an, an island of, of uh, cooperation and bipartisanship, and it's come uh, with tremendous health benefits, both for ozone layer uh, related diseases and for the reduction of climate change. And it's come at imperceptible impact on consumers. Thank you very much. Um, 
I will now uh, recognize Mr. Shimkus, subcommittee ranking member, for five minutes to ask questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Galen, Mr. Bedard, and Mr. Lieberman, and I, Mr. Doniger also. You all talked about an orderly transition versus disorder. You've all talked about uh, a rational transition. Uh, so two questions. Um, would a orderly, wouldn't it be more orderly, especially in this day and age, that we would allow state preemption, uh, we would have a preemption language in this bill? And, and from the point of the Interstate Commerce, Com in, in, uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee, the International Commerce Clause is the constitutional provision that, that gives us our power to be involved in interstate commerce issues. Um, so let me start with Mr. Lieberman. Would it be helpful for an orderly versus disorderly transition using term terminology that you all have stated in your, that there be state preemption? If uh, certainty and order was the goal, there are some flaws with this bill, especially the lack of uh, state preemption. Uh, this is going to be a, a, a very big challenge if we set a set of uh, federal requirements to phase out HFCs. And then if on top of that, California can go in its own direction, uh, other states which are already doing that uh, uh, can go also in their own direction, um, that makes it a lot more difficult. So I think one set of, uh, of standards should be, uh, should be, uh, should be enough. Uh, I'd also point out with the uh, accelerator clause, we don't know how orderly and certain this is good. This could happen a whole heck of a lot faster than anybody here is talking about. Well, that, and that, I mean, my next question was gone on the accelerator clause. Mr. Kelly, what certainty is there in, in a bill language that would allow us to change and accelerate this provision to an unknown time? probably would have been good to ask the EPA for some, because I think the bill actually provisions to allow them to petition, and there's a review, just as the EPA has done previously. But don't, don't you agree that having that provision, instead of a state, a, a federal standard across the board that applies to all the states, would bring more certainty versus less certainty? And then you, then you bring in the accelerator provision, which creates more uncertainty. Uh, Mr. Bedard? Sure. Um, I, I think the best way to answer that is to look at what history says, and, and that in the absence of, of a federal program, what happens is, is you do see that balkanization of regulation. In the past, uh, when we've had a single federal standard, essentially the states just follow the federal standard. Well, that's true for 40 years ago when we did ozone. That's, Mr. Lieber, in your testimony, you mentioned, uh, was it CAFE and the possible current actions of federal law that doesn't that doesn't support that issue. I'm not asking you, Mr. Doniger. I'm asking Mr. <laughs> Lieberman. Um, yeah, well, if, if, if we don't want the states to keep going in their own direction, we should put it in writing. Is that clear? It's, that's the certainty aspect. Yeah. That's one of the, my, uh, my, my friends, and we discussed during legislative hearings on the side, they say, oh, trust us, because it didn't work for ozone. But the ozone era was 40 years ago. Different era than now when we have a, a uh, California environmental agency that likens itself to be the federal EPA. Uh, and then you have New York follow, you'll have New Hampshire, you, you'll have these states. So there is no certainty in this language that because there's no state preemption. Let me uh, also, I'm going to ask you as consent, I know you're going to look at it later on and make an approval of this uh, economic impact of Kigali Amendment ratification. It, it speaks um, in, in language. Look, I, the first question I want to ask is, Mr. Bernard, you might be able to answer this. It says in this report that 49 percent of HVAC uh, equipment are imported into the United States. Is that accurate? 49, again, it's, it's 89 percent. Uh, Mexico, 44 percent. China is 27. South Korea, 10. Canada, 4. Japan, 4 percent. Again, HVAC equipment is a very broad Topic, so it could be room air conditioners okay. and those types of things. Okay, my point, uh, my point being is we, you know, we got to be careful when we hear testimony. Um, if this, these if manufacturings are, are overseas, uh, the impact, the reason why they're being produced overseas is because low cost, low uh, equipment, uh, parts. But you're spinning the hearing to say. We are. We may be doing the research and development. We may have the corporate headquarters, but we're not building. We're not building 
the, the equipment. Uh, last question is, H HFC refrigerants, refrigerants currently cost four to six pounds on Amazon compared to $40 to $60 per pound of HFOs. Is that an accurate price comparison, Mr. Galen? Yeah, I heard that in, in earlier testimony, so I don't follow the exact price of refrigerants. But well, maybe we should. If we're going to be talking about consumers and their costs, maybe we should look at that cost. And I'll yield back my time. Well, can I continue to answer the question? Um, Please. We have mic problems. Okay, or maybe it's my problem. Um, look, do put it in context. Today, if you look at the broad base of different types of equipment, in a residential air conditioning system, the cost of refrigerant represents something like 1% of the cost of that system. In a commercial system, it's something like a quarter of a percent. So it, it's a contributor, yes, okay? But what I also heard earlier was talking about replacing R134A, so it's a chemical refrigerant, it's HFC today, to a specific HFO that was mentioned. That's not the only option. There are many options. And I would say that it depends very much on the specific application. Let me be specific. A white goods appliance refrigerator today has historically used R134A. Around the world and the other millions of refrigerators have for more than two decades used a hydrocarbon, R600A, isobutane. I would, fair to say, that those prices are equal or less. Mr. Chairman, and if I may, because of the two-minute explanation of the question, the reality is uh, $6 per pound for HFCs versus $60 per pound for HFOs, and I yield back my time. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Peters for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, San Diego is not thought of a big ma as a big manufacturing town, but we have companies with household names in defense, aerospace, shipbuilding and repair, medical devices, even craft brewing uh, headquartered there. And we benefit tremendously from our close proximity to Mexico, which I've mentioned many times uh, before. Um, and it's estimated that the value of the co-producing manufacturing supply chain in San Diego County, Imperial County, and Baja California is about $2.5 billion. So Mexico is committed to transitioning away from HFC. Uh, keeping our markets aligned and maintaining a strong relationship between the U.S. and Mexico uh, is vital to the San Diego region. And today's testimony suggests that if enacted, the AIM Leadership Act will provide certain trade benefits. According to one study, the transition to next generation technologies would increase the U.S. share of global HVACR market by 25 percent. Uh, and that would lead to a $12.5 billion positive swing in the balance of trade for the HVACR sector. Conversely, uh, if we did, we went along with the so-called disorderly transition, um, the prediction is we would lose about 14 percent of our current market share. So I'd like to ask the industry representatives, Mr. Bedard and Mr. B Mr. Gallion, how does that how does that play out? And if we, who who are the winners? And if we did not go forward with this with this kind of orderly transition, and maybe we have to massage it to make it perfect, uh, who are the losers? We'll start with you, Mr. G uh, Gallion. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I think here that we have and, and are today the leaders. So our R&D, our engineers, our manufacturers are the state of the art and the reference in the global economy. And we compete globally. If the national standards are something different than what's moving in the global standards, we'll not invest for that R&D here. But our competitors globally will. And they're in China, they're in Asia, they're in Europe. And they will take a lead because they're serving their own markets that are typically under a national framework to move to something, uh, to, to have a, a phase uh, down framework. And we're trying to export to those countries with those new standards, is that correct? Correct. But if we're relying most of our production on the old way of right. doing it to the new way, we'll not also be competitive and we'll lose market share. And I right. think that's what the study reflects. M manufacturers so tend to have centers of excellence, both from a design point of view as well as from a manufacturing mm -hmm. point of view. And to the, extent, to the extent that we are dissimilar from the rest of the world, those design centers and those manufacturing centers will be elsewhere. Let me ask you another question just about the um, cross-border shipments. I asked Ms. Newberg from, UPA, from EPA this morning um, uh, about the limits on how much HFC can be imported. There's no uh, limit right now. Uh, she testified that if HR 5544 becomes law, imports would also be subject to the phase-down program. Um, would set up a system for tracking imports and imports would be unlawful without an, al an allowance. Uh, and I understand that um, there have been long-standing concerns among American manufacturers that foreign pr producers of HFCs 
are exporting them to the, U to the U.S., heavily subsidizing their price, which undercuts American-made products and potentially violates trade rules. Again, Mr. Bedard, um, can you address maybe how the AIM Leadership Act would address these anti-competitive practices, and particularly with reference to China? So there are um, there are restrictions in in, in the bill um, on the on the import um, of of those substances and and from that point of view uh, that would limit uh, the dumping, yeah. if you will. Mr. Gowning, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, we we are aware, and actually it's been recognized that in a lot of cases China has been dumping refrigerants or or uh, being subsidized, and then uh, while there has been some uh, uh, attempts to restrict that. There is the movement to other countries, right. which doesn't uh, allow a, a benefit here. So this bill would allow regulations of all imports and put it on a level playing field. Right. So it just seems to me that um, it's rare that we have uh, an industry sort of um, from small to large across the country interested in the federal government setting a re regulatory framework um, that other groups don't object to. And it seems to me that we ought to take that opportunity uh, we had to pursue this, and I, I do understand that there may be some massaging, and I've got a list of issues here that people have raised. Uh, we should do that. That's the purpose of uh, a, a hearing on this legislation, but it does strike me that it's important uh, for trade and for business and for industry that we move forward today. Uh, it doesn't bother me that it's uh, helpful to the environment as well. So I'm happy to be a co-sponsor of this. I look forward to continuing work. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the hearing, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Walden, full committee Thank ranking you, member, chairman. for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bedard, if I heard you correctly, you said uh, about this bill that this sets up a national single federal standard, right? That was what you said in your testimony. It does, yes. But yet it doesn't have state preemption in it, correct? That is correct. So do you think that states won't, on their own, try and do something beyond this national federal standard? I mean, frankly, the states have other things to do. They have other work to do. Uh, in the absence of, I, what I can tell you with certainty is without a federal standard, they will. So let me ask you this. Do you oppose a preemption provision added to this bill? Do I oppose it? Yep. No, I do not. Mr. Doniger, do you oppose a federal preemption if we're going to set a federal standard? I do. Op we would oppose it. All right. Uh, Mr. Mr. Lieberman. May I explain? Well, let, let me add, just get that answer. Then I'll come back to you. Yeah. But Mr. Lieberman? We would put some lipstick on this page, yes. <laughs> All right. Mr. Gallion? Yeah. The priority for, for industry and the HR members is to have a federal framework. Federal framework or a federal preemption? That's my question. The priority is yes or federal no? framework. Is that? Okay. I, I need to understand what you mean by federal framework. I, I think there are... Uh, a federal framework sets a standard of which then the states can refer to. I'm, I'm, that so that's a not a preemption. So, so you're telling me you don't support a federal preemption? I think the priority for industry All right. is that we have a federal framework. Yeah, that's different than a preemption. Because if, for me, and I think this Mr. Shimkus's point, is we can set up a federal framework for you, but our history is maybe different than yours in that states tend to then try and one-up the federal government or precede the federal government, to your point, Mr. Bedard. Um, but you, you don't support that. Um, uh, Mr. Donger, I said I'd go back to you, and I will. Thank you. Uh, under Title VI for, from the 1990 Clean Air Act, we have had no preemption, and there has been no significant state activity beyond the federal minimum. Why? Because there's a strong federal program and the states use yeah. their resources to do other things. Yeah. States are active in this area now because there's a gap. There's a okay, I'm gonna the federal. Uh, I appreciate uh, that. I'm going to uh, reclaim my time, stand sir. Down. I, I reclaim my time because we have seen this happen in CAFE standards where there is a federal standard in place, and other states right. then have proceeded to, to find um, their own paths, which sets up all kinds of conflict. Um, I noticed, too, that, that you also mentioned, uh, Mr. Denier, um the issue of wildfires. Uh, we're seeing what's happening in Australia. Uh, my district's been ravaged by wildfires uh, over the years. When I chaired the committee, we had multiple hearings on the air quality effects of wildfire. And I, I have to confess, I, I looked up on your website uh, NRDC's views of uh, biomass and your hatred toward them, I guess I would call it that. Um, it's, well, I'll let you read it and decide, 
But if we don't do a better job of managing our federal forests to reduce the overstocking that put, puts them completely out of balance with nature, well, you're gonna have fires uh, worse than what we're seeing in the last few years. So I, I would hope that we could have a discussion about that at some point. But at this point, I'll yield to my friend from Oklahoma, Mr. Mullen, the remainder of my time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Walden. Um, can, can someone ask me, or can someone please tell me um, who came up with the idea of this bill? Did the EPA think there was a need uh, to make this change in refrigerant from the 410A to the ATL? This is, this Somebody? Is, this is something that's been uh, uh, bubbling up for about a decade or more. I well, think the, the genesis of it particularly comes from Honeywell, which has patented a number of these substitute. So the manufacturing industry came up with yeah, it? Yeah, and the first attempt to put it in law was the cap and trade bill of about a decade. So there ago. wasn't, the EPA didn't like sound the alarm that there was an environmental urgency to make this change. It was the manufacturers thought maybe it'd be a good idea to go ahead and make this change. Is, is that fair to say? I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I, I think a, a better characterization will be that under the Montreal Protocol, um, when, when the HFCs were introduced. Excuse me on this one. The, that called for the removal of the R22 to Correct. go to the 410A. I'm trying Correct. to figure out why I, we're I understand making the Congress. change to go to the 410A. And all I'm saying is I, who came up with the I understand, idea? but at the, time, at the time that transition occurred, industry recognized, everyone recognized that there was a global warming potential issue with the HFCs. So, so I would say the genesis of the but, concern was uh, probably at, the, at let, the time of the initial trend. Then why did we get sold on changing it to the 410As? If you already knew there was a concern, and I'm, I'm out of time, I yield back, my, and I'll get back to that, but why, why then was there an urgency to switch from the R22 to the 410A and now go on the A2L? I, that's a bigger question well, that I, I don't have back. time to get into. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, Representative Barron for five minutes, please. Thank you. Um, I want to follow up a little bit, um, Mr. Galen and, and Mr. Uh, Bedard. Uh, we understand and that this bill will help produce jobs. Um, can you both speak to how many jobs this bill might help protect and create? Um, if you have any info on California in particular, or Southern California, that would be helpful as well. Do you want it? I can uh, can speak to the the number of jobs we've estimated by a third party. I think it was University of Maryland already. We twenty or three thirty three thousand new manufacturing jobs. Um, I can't remember the exact number. I can dig it up in my notes here real quick. But it, it protects something more than one hundred and twenty thousand um, existing jobs today uh, in the. That are supporting the HVACR business. Great, uh, Mr. Bedard, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, not necessarily, Congressman. We we're just uh, talking about the the number of jobs throughout throughout the U.S. We manufacture mm -hmm. uh, in in a number of different states. We have lots of manufacturing workers uh, in the U.S. Uh, we do not have them in, in California, uh, but we certainly have salespeople and, and wholesale distribution folks and. Uh, and so, um, again, the number was 33,000 jobs, and it will be spread Great. across uh, a number of different uh, types. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Doniger, um, in your testimony, you say that transitioning off of HFCs can curb global warming by nearly half a degree Celsius. Can you briefly speak to the scale of how great an accomplishment this could be to achieve this through a bill at no cost? Yes, thank you. Let me point out that the phase out of uh, CFCs before this has accomplished uh, already prevented one degree Celsius of warming in the Arctic. And the Arctic is, is warming much faster than the global average. And by the middle of the century, we'll have avoided a degree uh, 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 global average. That's equivalent to postponing the effect of climate change, as I said in my testimony, by 10 years. So it would be that much worse now if we hadn't acted. The same thing is happening with HFCs. They are not as potent, but there's a lot more of them because the in, as our uh, air conditioning industry is growing, our, the world air conditioning and refrigeration industry is growing, the leakage is growing, and if we let that go, we will get another half degree of warming uh, on top of what we're expecting. We're struggling 
to hold warming to two degrees or one and a half degrees. Already we have these uh, fires, floods, sea level rise, and so on. It will only get worse if we layer on uh, the additional emissions from, from HFCs. So that's why it's so important to phase these chemicals down and to act now before, it's an emer before we have to do it on an emergency basis. Great. Uh, Mr. Bedard, can you speak to how the bill will strengthen the HVACR's industry's competitiveness abroad? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I, I've got a unique position. I have responsibility for HVAC in Europe. And I can tell you that um, there's more certainty in Europe, <laughs> believe it or not, than in the U.S. in terms of taking a look at where, where things are going from an air conditioning point of view. And if, if you take a look at w how that strengthens us globally is we don't have to waste our time on things that won't happen. Um, and and if, if you understand where the direction is, if the supply chain understands where the direction is, um, essentially um, it, it's more fruitful investment throughout the entire supply chain and the market grows. Great. Well, um, I just want to say uh, I want to congratulate um, Congressman Tonko and Peters and Olson and Stefanik for putting this legislation together, both this bill and the comparable Senate bill are bipartisan, uh, something that you don't get too often on environmental concerns and issues and certainly on addressing climate change. And so to hear about what it could help do to address that, um, which I believe is critical, is, um, is so great. And this particular bill has a co-equal number of Democrats and Republicans um, that support it, uh, which is a nice thing to see, especially in today's time. It's supported by HVACR industry, the Chamber of Commerce, and NRDC. And it's never easy to achieve the level of consensus that this bill has done. So this HVC initiative is a triple win for jobs, for consumers, and the environment. I look forward to supporting it, and I urge all of my colleagues on the committee to do the same. And uh, just want to thank you again for having this hearing today. I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative McKinley for five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, in 2016, 2016, there was a, apparently there was a conference in uh, Rwanda uh, and they developed uh, this, uh, an amendment, the Kugali, if I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, this Kugali amendment that was to phase down the HFCs. Uh, but that never was ratified by the, the, by the Senate uh, here in the United States. Uh, so it's been sitting there since 16. I'm, I'm curious, Mr. Chairman, is there, a, maybe, maybe a, someone here could answer, is there a difference between the Kugali Amendment and, and this, this specific legislation? Is there a difference between the two? Okay, Mr. Lieberman. Um, very small differences. This is the legislative attempt to get the U.S. on track for perhaps future ratification of, uh, of the Kigali Amendment. But you're right, we haven't, we haven't ratified it. So there are questions what we should be doing in the absence of ratification. Thank you. Okay. Now, it, it's my understanding that uh, under that Montreal Protocol um, that it wouldn't go into effect until 20-some countries had, had, um, had ratified that agreement. Have, have 20 some countries ratified that, so it's in effect? 91. It's, it's in effect, um, but um, developing nations, which incidentally includes China, have generous extensions of time to uh, continue using um, HFCs. They demanded and got a lot of extra time to stick with the old refrigerants. That's why the claims of, uh, of exports uh, may be overblown. These nations demanded and got extra time to continue using HFCs. They've also said at the UN that they're not interested in switching to these new refrigerants unless they're subsidized to do so through something called the, the UN Multilateral Fund. And most yeah. of the demand growth around the world is from these developing nations who just really don't have an interest in these newer and largely more expensive refrigerants. So is the... Is, I, I'd like to understand maybe, Mr. Lieberman, maybe, um, you, because you've obviously been paying attention to this legislation more than I, um, why didn't the Senate take it up? Why did we, why did we not ratify that treaty? Uh, it has to be submitted by the President to the Senate. President Obama chose not to do so. Well, President okay, Trump well that, that was that, okay, but, but my question, why not? He's the one that they, they, they 
they agreed to the thing in Rwanda, why didn't he submit it to the Senate for ratification? I could only guess, I would guess he, he was concerned about the number of votes at the time. That's, that's President Obama. And I would guess that President Trump uh, may not support this effort. But that's, those are, that's just a guess on my part. Okay, so he, someone has to submit. All right, uh, I've got two minutes left. Uh, if I could yield uh, my time uh, to the gentleman from Oklahoma, if he'd like to continue his line of questioning. There, there's been a lot of question about the industry supporting this and, and um, why I agree the industry does. Uh, I mean, let's be honest, for, for uh, and industry, it's great. It's job security. I mean, wouldn't this make sure that you guys are still producing units going forward, Mr. Bernard? We certainly intend to continue to heat and cool people's homes. Sure. Uh, but we talk a lot about all the industry supporting it. Um, but once again, we, we leave out the consumer. I mean, if the consumer begins to understand what their options are going to be, for instance, when we f uh, uh, Ben, when we phase out the 410A, what refrigerant is going to be replacing that? That's a good question, and, and we've talked a little bit about certainty, sure. but there really isn't any front runner to replace 410A, so we are going to see a number of different refrigerants, some different companies going in different directions. And as you know from your history, the proliferation of refrigerants is a very big problem. You don't know if the right refrigerant was used by the last person right. to, uh, to repair the system. So it's the proliferation of refrigerants that, that is, is a problem, and it's not helped by this bill. And, and if you change refrigerants out, then the equipment doesn't operate the same. Is that correct, Mr. Bernard? The, the equipment is designed for certain For certain. So if you phase out R22, then 410A won't work with it. And if you phase out the 410A, then the A2L won't work very good with it, right? That's correct. Is the A2L, which is commonly refu used to right now to replace a 410A, uh, what's the problem with it? Uh, well, there are some flammable refrigerants that are being introduced. Uh, flammability risks can largely be engineered around. Mm -hmm. They can't be completely eliminated, but they, they, they can be reduced. They're more of a problem for some types of equipment than others. I would say it's, it's, it's a safety issue, but it's also a cost issue because the things you have to do in order to reduce those risks cost money. And right. these flammable refrigerants are particularly an issue in retail environments where there's proximity to, uh, to customers and employees, and there's lease issues and insurance right. issues and building code issues. And these issues are on their way to being worked out, but there's a long way to go, and they're still silent on that. And the consumer will be paying that bill, not yeah. the manufacturers or the installers. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from Delaware, uh, Representative Blunt Rochester, for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, in your absence, I. Uh, now that you're back, I'd like to say thank you for your leadership and support on this bill, as well as Mr. Peters, uh, Mr. Olson, and Ms. Stefanik. I also wanted to acknowledge that uh, the senior senator from the state of Delaware, uh, Tom Carper, actually is the lead on this bill on the Senate side. And I want to thank our witnesses for joining us as well. Um, this bill is a combination of, proven regulatory, of a proven regulatory framework, an industry that's innovating next generation technologies, providing both environmental and economic gains. It's nonetheless um, notable and some might say remarkable uh, to see NRDC and two businesses, uh, business associations sitting at the same table in support of this bipartisan legislation and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers are also on the record for officially supporting this bill. Um, it's also rare, some would say these days, that Republicans and Democrats um, can be in support of the same thing. Small, medium, and large businesses, labor, environmentalists, can all agree on something, but this legislation does just that. H.R. 5544 will boost American innovation and manufacturing, stimulate our economy, which leads to, uh, in, ensures that we're competitive, and create tens of thousands of new and highly high-quality jobs. Uh, I'm going to start my first question with uh, Mr. Doniger. Can you describe how the environmental and business communities came to agree to support this bill? Could you sh share a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, the, as I said a, a little while ago, the, the, our uh, environmental and business interests originally were very much at odds back in the 
early 80s. Uh, but we found common ground, and the common ground is on the notion of a transitional period mm -hmm. for each of these uh, uh, transitions, not an, o not an overnight ban, uh, but also that it should happen with some dispatch. And uh, also that there was an uh, advantage in having a strong federal framework. The, the states were going to operate, uh, enter the area if the federal government did not. That's what's happening now. The states are, are not going to be active in this area if there is a strong federal program. <laughs> <laughs> you can repeat it again, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I must have said Alexa. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the, uh, uh, we have, we, we don't always agree. NRDC would like these transitions to go more quickly. We, but we started work on this in the Bush administration, mm -hmm. in the George W. Bush administration. And it took 10 years to come to fruition in international negotiations. Uh, but we've always led with, the, with the domestic legislation. The international treaty is not what governs these guys. It's American legislation. And that's what we need to do now. Now, I only have a minute and 40 seconds left. So there are two things that keep coming up. Um, one is um, cost and the other, um, so, uh, and, and the other is safety. Can I ask Mr. Galen to speak on those? Yeah, please, thank you, and uh, appreciate the opportunity, Congressman. So let me s say two clarifying points. So under the Montreal Protocol and the other, the CFCs, because all you guys are, are not that familiar with, but that was actually a phase out. I just need to be clear that this w bill is proposing a phase down, and it's orderly over 15 years. I've heard it come up time and time again that what about service and replacement? It's 15 years, there will be ample refrigerants available for those existing applications for service and repair for the full lifetime of those individual products. I can then tell you switch to safety. This industry and the member companies, including my own, have a track record of safety. It's really important to us. We manage today gas furnaces, which are in propane as well as natural gas, same for water heating equipment, boilers, uh, and the like. And we know how to do that. And it's very important and critical for the business. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your and testimony. I, and I would just add, okay. Congresswoman, yes, um, safety is very, very important to us. It, it is our number one consideration. Um, I'm not here to ask Congress questions. Just think to yourselves, how many of you have natural gas or propane in your home? You probably do. As long as the installation practices are that way, as long as the equipment is designed for it, you can do it. We're asking for your help. The longer that we have, the certainty that we have, we can exercise a, a fragmented supply chain to train the, the installation folks and get this done the right way, as we've done twice in the past. Thank you so much, and I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Long for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. And before I came to Congress, I had a 30-year career, a little over 30 years in the auction business. Over 20 of those 30 years, I did over 200 auctions a year. That's quite a few auctions. So I've wrestled with this issue for all of those 30 years because as refrigerants would be in-lawed and then out-lawed, and you had to be careful what you were selling, what was in that, who had done it the last time, as you've talked about here today, you know, it's uh, an issue, like I said, I've wrestled with for quite a while. And I, you can see from the sling I'm in that I wasn't very good at wrestling my daughter's poodle back uh, on the 20th of December. But uh, for the rest of my time, my four minutes and 15 seconds, I'm going to yield five minutes of that time <laughs> to, to one of the uh, foremost wrestlers ever to come out of the state of Oklahoma, my, my buddy Mark Wayne Mullins. I, would, I don't know if I can take that title, but I will say I, I, I was decent. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we, before, we, uh, before we quit talking a while ago, we talked about additional measures that could be done to install this safe. And, Mr. Bernard, you mentioned that just a second ago. Which additional measures can be done, like ventilation, right? Right. Yes? I mean, there, if it's there are a number of different things. If it's flammable, it's got to be ventilated. There, there are a number of different approaches, yes. Um, but we, you talked about natural gas appliances, and we hear every year homes exploding because of natural gas leaks. Uh, we hear of water heaters that are supposed to be ventilated correctly, uh, and their pressure relief valve isn't supposed to be capped off, but the homeowner decided to, to cap off the pressure relief valve on the side of the water heater because they didn't know what it was because it was leaking, 
or they cap off the, the ventilation because it was allowing cold air to go in and because the installers are trained on it, but the homeowner isn't. And so when we start talking about safety, we start talking about a safe way to do this. Mr. Bernard, what is a life worth to you? We, we, no, no, our, I, I, our products are safe. No, 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 I didn't ask Congressman, that question. Our products what are safe. What is a life worth to you? Our products are safe and we go through Mr. multiple Mr. Doniger, what is a, what is a life worth to make you? Sure. I'm offended by the question. No, I'm not. Because I'm the installer. And if a, if a house were to explode or a house were to catch on fire, who's liable for that life? Because we're talking about going from a refrigerant that is non-flammable to a replacement refrigerant that is flammable. I'm an installer. Believe me, safety is first and foremost. I know you don't create products to make them unsafe, you make them safer. But we are still talking about a refrigerant that we're replacing that is mildly flammable. And if you know anything about consumers, if it's mildly flammable, it's flammable. So what is a life worth? And then who's going to be liable for this if we do lose, lose a life? Anybody? I think there are a lot of issues that haven't been thought through. Agreed. So with regard to flammability and flammable refrigerants, there's a reason this industry has tried to avoid using refl flammable refrigerants for as long as it's could. They have to consider new ones now that other things, the non-flammable ones, one after around the other, have been uh, replaced. One, one quick point I wanted to make with yeah. regard to the claim that the, the Montreal Protocol was a phase out. Actually, it wasn't. It started out as a very reasonable phase down, but it had one of these accelerator clauses. So before the ink was dry, uh, organizations, I think including NRDC, pushed to accelerate the deadlines, and we ended up with a, uh, a much tougher uh, uh, deadline than we originally uh, started with, and that phase down of yeah. HFCs can also be accelerated. And Mr. Gallon, is that how you say it? Gallagher, yeah. You said that the, that the products are available through the lifespan of the equipment, is that right? Refrigerants will be available for the service and repair of those systems for their useful life. What's to consider a useful life? Generally, in a, an air conditioning system is around 15 years. So for 15, 20 that. years, Linux is going to produce both refrigerants? We don't produce refrigerants, Congressman. However, if you want to buy R22 today, you can. At what cost? It, it's again, At what cost? Because again, that's, that's the important thing. What cost is it? Because I know the cost. So what is the cost uh, of, of the refrigerant right now to replace R22, to buy R22? So I know the wholesale cost is a little bit, uh, it's probably... Uh, Twelve dollars a pound or something like that wholesale. And what do you try to? But you can't buy it wholesale right now. Uh, so we sell it to contractors. So I I don't sell it to consumers. The so contractors in turn sell. So it the point them. is the refrigerant is priced out, and if you price it out, then you price out the equipment. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The uh, chair now recognizes Representative McNerney for five minutes, please. I thank the chairman. I thank the witnesses this morning. Uh, useful testimony. Uh, I think it's important to highlight the fact, as Mr. Galen mentioned, uh, H.R. 5544 does not force anyone to abandon existing refrigeration or air conditioning equipment and really requires a phase down as opposed to a phase out. Uh, Mr. Galen, the cost difference between HFCs and uh, HFOs has been mentioned a couple of times this morning, uh, but is there a likely decrease in cost uh, of HFOs as they phase into large-scale production? as it becomes commercial in equal scale. But I, I want to clarify if I can. The HFCs are not naturally going to go to HFOs. There are... Can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry. Th there are many options. It's not a given that HFCs are going to transition to HFOs. There are many, many chemical options. They just all have a lower global warming potential or near zero in some cases if we're talking about um, hydrocarbons and the such. It will vary very much by application. Thank you. Mr. Bernard, I like your comment that this legislation proposes to use uh, known, proven policy approaches uh, to, to uh, accomplish the goals of reducing 
uh, HFCs. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yes, sir. Now, I've been in the HVAC business for 30 years, so I've experienced two major transitions. One where the R20, or, I'm sorry, the CFCs were transitioned in the early 90s, and one where the R410A replaced R22 in 2010. And what that gave us was a level of certainty where we planned um, with gradually increasing, I'm sorry, gradually decreasing quotas uh, that essentially scaled down the availability of uh, the other refrigerants, and it allowed us what I'd call as a soft landing. Um, and so we see this as a very similar approach, one that we're very comfortable with. Excellent. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Doninger, um, does HR 5544, in your opinion, embrace the same legal framework that currently exists in Title VI? Yes, it's modeled very closely on Title VI the phase down uh, of production and consumption, and the other provisions are uh, modeled on Title VI. Well, can you speak to how the encouragement and certainty that H.R. 5544 provides will assist us in maintaining and extend, uh, extending American leadership? Right now, American companies have the lead uh, in many areas of the technology and uh, stuff they make here as well as uh, the um, know-how for stuff made elsewhere in the world. And other countries, uh, other companies in other countries are trying hard to wrest that lead. Uh, they have clear guidance from their governments about the phase down. Uh, it's uh, the lack of clarity here is uh, um, uh, risking the lead that the American companies have, as well as risking the environmental benefit that comes from phasing these chemicals down. So what was involved in maintaining American leadership? Was it uh, industrial investment in R&D, or, or what would go into that? In my perception, and of course I'm, I'm not in, one, in the companies, <coughs> but that the companies were motivated to put a lot of money and a lot of planning into the transition uh, between the late Bush administration through the Obama administration, because they saw this transition coming uh, coming and coming into uh, focus. Uh, and now uh, we need to solidify it with federal legislation that would um, uh, give them the guidance they need. Okay, Mr. Gannon, could you take a stab at that? What has been involved in establishing American leadership and can we build on that uh, leadership stance that we have now with with this legislation. Yes, uh, yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, for sure, I think that's what the bill's intent is. I mean, Willis Carrier uh, invented air conditioning um, in the United States way back when. We have, since that time, have got the, the good experience, the great engineers, the great designs that's recognized here and it's recognized around the world. But as Mr. Doninger said, if we give way and let other countries or companies in those countries who are designing to their own national frameworks they will get a lead to us and eventually get an advantage in the marketplace and make American companies less competitive. That's a risk. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. <coughs> yeah, gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Rogers for five minutes, please. Thirty-three thousand new manufacturing jobs in the United States of America. Mr. Lieberman, do you agree that the bill will directly lead to new jobs in the U.S.? It's probably not going to be thirty-three thousand, and they're probably not going to be American. Um, I saw that study on jobs, and one word that was missing from the study was outsourcing, which is interesting because this is an industry, the air conditioning refrigeration industry, that has been very aggressively outsourcing in recent decades. And in fact, some of the biggest supporters of this bill are some of the biggest outsourcers. And that includes the products that are, uh, that are being touted as the next big thing if this bill were to pass. For example, those HFO refrigerants that we were uh, talking about and for which uh, Honeywell and Chemours hold patents. Well, both Honeywell and Chemours built their first production of HFOs in China. So all of the jobs, or some of the jobs, and all of the technology has been handed over to the, the, the Chinese. And, and the, the, for, for with, uh, with regard to uh, equipment makers, they, uh, they buy compressors, motors, 
refrigerants, other components from all over the world. And they do so because it's a cost-cutting measure. You want to get the cheapest products consistent with, uh, with quality. And so uh, I find it very hard to believe that that cost-cutting incentive to outsource is going to come to an end if this bill were to, uh, th to pass. The, the, the reality is this bill does nothing to encourage exports. The only thing this bill does is uh, hamper the U.S. market by restricting the low-cost option for American consumers. I think that's a very important point as we think about American leadership, American competitiveness, and the importance of us leading and the rest of the world following our leadership. And if any company thinks that these new refrigerants and equipment really are the, the future, they're free to go ahead and move in that direction. They, they don't need the AIM Act to make this new step. Okay. Uh, I'm, I would like to yield the remainder of my time to the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Mullen. I know this hearing's winding down, and I, I want to make a, a point. I'm not saying that anybody is purposely deceiving or misleading or is for, uh, is for sacrificing a life for a product. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we're disguising this and not being true to the consumer of understanding what their choice is. What Ben just said is we don't have to have this bill for that. We can make the consumer allow the consumer to choose do i want a flammable or a non-flammable product in there we've already the epa already said that the 410a doesn't hurt the ozone and and we say that and and, and in fact uh we were even told that the that mr doniger i think you said in your testimony that in your lifetime the ozone is already being rebuilt for your children is that you that said that in your testimony? Yes, but we have another problem but to do. I, I get that, but what I'm saying is, is the consumers have been left out of this out of this conversation. The cost to install these un units is a real cost, and we need to make sure that the consumer is is one aware of what their choices are, and two, understand what the cost is to them. That's what I represent. I, I'm not representing industry of any sort. I'm just representing my customers, my constituents, my consumers, and all of our consumers. And 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 Ben, when you were when you were discussing the replacement and you're discussing the the cost of the jobs that the, that the consumers are going to have to bear of as meaning the installation of it, that's all I'm talking about. I, I understand the point, Congressman. I, I guess I would just point out that. This transition is underway. It's happening. It's it's occurring. It's occurring in different states. And the only question is, um, you know, how is it going to happen? Under what terms? And are we going to accrue the benefits? Um, but we're asking for your help um, to provide that federal structure that will help us. That will help the entire supply chain and will help the consumer. Absent that structure, um, many of the things that you're predicting likely would occur. But with that structure, is with very important. Pre preemption, as you said, is important. Then it should be part of this bill. And not to mention that I believe what needs to also be part of this bill is consumer choice. I don't think we need a phase down or phase out where we're at today with the 410A, considering we're just now phasing out the R22 to the 410A, and we're already planning on already phasing it out. That means the products aren't going to be online, and that means the consumer today is going to be buying something that they already know is out of compliant because we're moving it forward. And so uh, I just, they have to be part of the conversation. I appreciate every one of you guys here, and I appreciate your time. I think I'm out of time. For, yeah, I'm out of time. The gentleman yields back. The uh, House is called votes, and so we're going to recognize uh, five more minutes from the Democratic side and then bring us to a close. So we now recognize a representative from California, Representative Matsui, for five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the witnesses for being here for so long. Um, I'm pleased to see the Energy and Commerce Committee is considering legislation that will phase down the production and consumption of HFCs for, from the American economy. This effort is a result of years of groundwork laid within the international community to take actions on a worldwide scale to reduce human use of substances that are harmful to our environment and public health. It is clear that this is not just a question of chemicals that contribute to climate change. It is a matter of whether our country wants to protect public health and remain competitive within the international community. Depletion of the ozone results in dangerous increase in levels of ultraviolet radiation, which leads to serious health concerns like skin cancer, immune disorders, and eye cataracts. 
Moreover, with the rest of the world already on schedule to phase out HFCs, industry is headed in a direction that will render HFC using equipment obsolete. We want to lead in this effort and not fall behind. We heard in Mr. Doniger's testimony significance of the Montreal Protocol and the broad support has received over the years, including from every U.S. president since Ronald Reagan. In fact, as I understand it, Mr. Bedard, this bill is based substantially on policy, policies and regulatory design concepts developed by President Reagan and President George H.W. Bush, which were applied with broad industry support to transition out of earlier generations of refrigerants. Mr. Bedard, isn't this bill simply a continuation of regulatory principles that have proven to foster greater competition, lower prices, and more innovation over the past 30 years? Yes, I would say that the, the structure is identical, and uh, I would expect the outcome to be very similar. The industry's grown, the jobs have grown, um, and, and it's, it, it gives us a framework from which to, um, from which to work. Okay. And Ms. Bedard, with 91 countries acting to phase down HFCs, what changes are we seeing within your industry at an international level, and what role have American companies played in this transition thus far? Sure. So, so we are using some of the new refrigerants in Europe. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we just had a job where we shipped one to Lebanon. Um, so it's not just Europe um, that, are, that are using the new refrigerants. Uh, the design work uh, for those refrigerants um, is being done in Europe, but it was substantially assisted by work that we've done in the U.S. Uh, I think over time, um, that uh, if the U.S. would not be that center of excellence, then obviously those jobs would go somewhere else, and, right. and that growth would go somewhere else. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, I'd like to yield the remainder of my time to my colleague from New York, Ms. Clark. I thank the gentlelady, and I thank our chairman and ranking member for convening this important hearing on the necessary phase down of climate warming hy hydrofluorocarbons. As Chairman Rush said the other day, climate change represents not only a tremendous threat to our future, but also a tremendous opportunity. An opportunity to create millions of new jobs, foster innovation in a new clean technologies, and increase the competitiveness of American businesses on the global stage. The American Innovation and Manufacturing Leadership Act represents one of these important opportunities. Transitioning away from HFCs towards climate-friendly alternatives will not only benefit the environment, it will also benefit American consumers with better products, increase the global competitiveness of our manufacturing sector, and spur the, ge the generation of thousands of new domestic jobs in this field. New York State is home to more than 2,600 direct jobs in, this, in, in, in the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration industry. And I anticipate that uh, with this legislation, we are poised to, to bring board even more. So I want to thank each of you for coming today, lending your expertise to this conversation, and uh, looking at how we can drill down and make this a reality. As I stated, I believe that we have an enormous opportunity here to simultaneously reduce cl climate warming emissions and bolster the American economy, and I look forward to supporting this legislation. I did have questions for all of you gentlemen. I'm going to submit them to our chairman so that you can uh, respond at, a, uh, at an appropriate time um, down the wire here. So thank you all very much, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentlewoman yields back. That concludes the uh, questioning of our panel. Um, I have before me a number of uh, documents that have been mutually agreed to. I request unanimous uh, consent to enter them. Uh, into the record without objection. And I would like to thank again our witnesses for joining us at today's hearing. I remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days by which to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by our witnesses. I ask each of our witnesses to respond promptly to any such questions that you may receive. And at this time, the subcommittee is adjourned.